So do I need to do anything to play or you'll do that from the back? The screen, yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to introduce and then the moderators will come up behind me. Right, Perfect, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the second day of Jeans. We are very excited to have you back today. Yesterday was just amazing. We had such a wonderful uh, group of speakers, and even better, we had amazing questions from the audience. Our discussions were excellent, and this is exactly what we wanted to provide. So today, um, we have two wonderful segments planned as well, and we're hoping that our audience members will do the same, that we'll have engaging discussions. Just wanted to mention some housekeeping items. Um, of course, this is our inaugural uh, symposium, and we are, you know, working very hard to make sure that our discussions are just that engaging, and our topics are also at the forefront of science, at the forefront of IVF. So we will send out a survey at the end of this conference, and we really encourage all attendees, all speakers, to go ahead and and give us your feedback. So that way, next year, we can provide you a more robust platform. Um, we would also like to um, we would also like to mention that after the um, at, at the break time today, um, if you would like, we, we don't have a late checkout, unfortunately, because of a following event after that is uh, on this weekend. So if you would like, we're more than happy to hold your backs here, or you can go ahead and use that time to check out, um, and then we will see you for that next segment. And so without any further ado, let me go ahead and introduce, uh, or actually request our moderators to come on and begin our first segment for the day. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Cristina Carvalho, and I will be moderating segment four, along with Dr. Mina Alicani, such an impactful part of IVF practice today, and so widely used, is pre-implantation genetic test. In this segment, our, spe our speak will de develop deeper into the technologies to other to offer a perspective beyond what's perce perce perceived by clinicians and embryologists. Our first speaker in this segment is Dr. Jason Swain. Dr. Jason is the Chief Laboratory Officer at, and President of Lab Operations for CCRM Fertility, a growing network of IVF centers in North America. Dr. Swan completed his BSc at Hillsdale, Hillsdale College in his native Michigan. Prior to helping start a CCRM fertility network in 2030, Dr. Swan was a clinical associate professor in the University of Michigan. He, he has pu he's published over 50 per reviewed articles and more than 130 abstracts, edited uh, and authored several books, 
chapters and contribute to various other publications with the field of assisted reproduction. His pri primary research interests include pursuit of methods to enhance in vitro embryo culture through development and, pre in and implementation of new technologies new technologies aimed at improving physical and chemical culture environment. Dr. Swan will present a crucial question. Can the IVF lab influence embryo aneuploid? Dr. Swan, welcome. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, uh, Sheila and, and Nabil, as well, for an amazing conference. So we should probably give them a round of applause as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, it could be considered a controversial topic, I'm really asking the question and hopefully uh, presenting data, and, and we can discuss and, and come to our own conclusions here, of whether the IVF lab uh, can influence embryo aneuploidy. And so, in terms of the impact of the lab in general on the chromosomal uh, uh, constitution of the embryo, I kind of think of this falling into three possible buckets. Um, uh, the first being there is a potential impact of the genetics lab, and we've got some fantastic uh, genetics lab folks here who could probably give us insight onto this. Um, but I'm not really going to talk uh, much about that. Uh, there's another bucket. Uh, that I think of as more of an artifact of the IVF lab, things like biopsy or processing techniques that could impact the quality of the genetic material that gets analyzed and, and could give some um, uh, artifact uh, and false readings. Uh, those two particular areas actually are going to be debated and discussed uh, here in July on Coronado Island by Dr. Yona Bardos and, and Debbie Veneer. And so there's a, a publication there at the top from, from Dr. Bardos in Fertility and Sterility that had um, some interesting discussions around it uh, uh, several months back. So if of interest, uh, there'll be that discussion. Uh, I'm not gonna really touch on those two areas. I'm gonna focus on that third uh, bucket, which is might the IVF lab actually induce or cause uh, embryo aneuploidy? And, and the question is, would this be of meiotic or mitotic origin? Uh, and we reviewed these topics briefly in a publication shown there a, a few years ago for those that have any interest. And really, the, the sort of genesis of that paper in, in this talk um, was uh, this paper, at least most recently this paper. And, and uh, the lead author is here in the, the audience. And so Dr. Munay could probably give some insight on this during the, the discussion uh, after the lectures. But it was a, a really widely discussed paper back from 2017 because they showed that the euploidy rates uh, from blastocysts from donor egg cycles differed significantly between IVF centers, and, and this was all uh, analysis done in the same genetics lab, so presumably the genetics lab uh, aspect was well controlled for, and they showed that it was up to 40% differences in rates of, of blastocyst euploidy in this donor uh, control population. So that was pretty alarming, and that suggested that, hey, there's something going on between these centers that can have a major impact on the quality of these embryos. And it was a retrospective study, um, but nonetheless still some, some interesting uh, information there, and, and they, in the discussion, uh, gave several potential explanations for why this might be, and some of those uh, were lab-based, and that was really kind of of uh, the embryologists of, of us in the group here. That would be of interest to us. Um, and as they noted in this manuscript, it was unclear with the technology used at the time <clears throat> if the aneuploidy was of meiotic or mitotic origin, and this would be an interesting or a very important question for us to answer in the laboratory in terms of if we are inducing some of these errors, where would we want to focus our efforts to avoid these errors? And so then fast forward a few years later and the technology had advanced. Uh, and you can see here from the titles, uh, several of these preliminary uh, studies are suggesting that indeed it, it's mitotic errors that can be influenced uh, by the IVF lab. So you can see there at the top from uh, Dagan Wells group at Eshra a few years back, Difference between embryology labs can influence rates of mitotic errors, leading to mosaicism. An ASRM paper uh, below that from the NYU group uh, in 2016 showing rates of uh, mosaic embryos or uh, presumably mitotic errors uh, varies between laboratories. And then on the bottom, 
there from Christina Hickman, uh, laboratory environment affects antiploidy with mitotic errors, not meiotic. And so these are three very good groups, Dagan Wells, Christina Hickman, uh, Jamie Griffo, Dave McCullough, and others, Santiago as well on that. So, so certainly people who know what they're talking about are indicating that perhaps the lab might be able to impact mitotic errors during the, the uh, culture of embryos in the labs. And, and so the question then comes up, well, what would be causing this? And, and so this is an interesting uh, paper from developmental cell. You can see here from the schematic to sort of simplify one uh, potential explanation for this and uh, simply put cellular stress can be associated with uh, antiploidy. And this was from somatic cells, not necessarily uh, embryos, but the idea being that stress could impact uh, mitosis and lead to antiploidy. And certainly cellular stress isn't something that's new to us uh, in this room who work in the lab. Uh, every day we are worried about trying to minimize various environmental stressors on the embryo because we know it can negatively impact their development and, and perhaps uh, mitosis and, and impact antiploidy. And so you can see just a sample of the number of stressors here that, that we think about each day in the lab and that our quality control procedures are presumably focused around to try to minimize to improve the culture environment. So a good place to start in, in discussing some of these potential stressors and potential impact on mitosis and resulting uh, embryo antiploidy is culture media. It's a pretty popular topic. We heard Dr. Sakis give a really nice review yesterday about single step and sequential media and the various aspects of those systems. And, and we know that culture media absolutely can impact embryo development. And there's decades worth of work showing that with altering energy substrate uh, composition and other factors. Um, now importantly, with varying culture media and emerging approaches, there are other factors that could come into play here and we'll discuss that. And so between single step media that are used in an uninterrupted fashion and time lapse incubators versus changing culture media, there's some other variables that start coming into play there uh, other than just media composition that could be an environmental stressor. Interestingly, most culture media <coughs> have a similar composition, uh, though the concentrations of specific ingredients um, uh, change. And we heard a little bit about amino acids yesterday, but this applies to all the, the composition. And, and this most recently was discussed very eloquently by uh, Dr. Paulson, who's here uh, in, uh, in Fertility and Sterility, that these recipes are no longer published. And so this does raise the concern, um, if media is impacting this, what are we putting our embryos into? Uh, we may know the list of ingredients, but we don't know the exact uh, composition. And so we, we had a paper a few years ago in Fertility and Reproduction where we uh, discussed uh, some of these points. And at that point in time, I think there were around 12 uh, uh, publications, many of them preliminary in nature, looking at usually comparing a single step versus sequential media, sometimes a single step media versus a single step media, trying to determine if the media itself might impact embryo mosaicism or, or uh, aneuploidy. And like much of what we study, there's sort of a mixed bag of results. Some studies said yes, uh, there would be an impact. Other studies said no impact. Uh, some of these studies weren't very well controlled, retrospective in nature. Some had a lot of uncontrolled variables, and I think the devil's in the details uh, with a lot of what we do, especially in this case. If you're truly trying to determine if culture media itself is impacting uh, embryo uh, aneuploidy, you really need to control for all the other variables and focus in on media. And a lot of these studies didn't do that uh, very well. And <clears throat> so I'll highlight a couple of those here to, to show you what I mean. So this was an abstract uh, from Eshra a few years ago, um, factors affecting embryo mosaicism. And so this was uh, uh, comparing mosaic blast rates between 27 clinics, and they looked at a variety of factors and tried to control these through uh, statistics. So they looked at things like oxygen tension, type of incubator, the type of culture media, relevance to, to this particular topic, timing of embryo checks, and a variety of other variables. And so they went through and did their, uh, uh, their statistics um, and they show that the mosaic rates differed between IVF centers 11 to 27 percent, so 16 percent difference. So that's in line with some of those earlier studies. Um, certainly really does appear that the different labs or different centers are getting different rates of, of mosaicism or, or embryo aneuploidy. <clears throat> they showed significant differences between continuous and sequential media. None of the other variables examined in this study, of which there were several, uh, showed significant difference. It was only the media. So that kind of got people looking further. And of no, I like to point out it was a 4% difference, but it was statistically significant. So 
Um, you can see here, probably not uh, a well-designed prospective study isolating the calls of culture media, but it does suggest that culture media could be in impactful. And, and so to maybe illustrate uh, the importance of these other variables uh, a little bit better, here's another publication from ESHRA, uh, from Christina Hickman and Dagan Wells and, and colleagues, <coughs> looking at um, the uh, euploid rate between uh, uh, laboratory, uh, different laboratories. They did use a sibling uh, split design, which is great, uh, control for that patient variable. They used two different single step media, a casome with a complex protein or a SAGE media with HSA. So they compared two single step media. They showed a significantly different aneuploidy rate between uh, these two media, and they were of, of mitotic origin. Um, of note though, as you read the finer print, they used the same incubators for both media to control for the impact of the incubator, an important factor, control for temperature. But as a result, they had the same CO2 concentration. The pH differed because the media were different. So the pH was 7.27 in one group, 7.14 in this group. So just from this simple abstract in, in summary here, I don't know that you can make any definitive conclusion about the impact of culture media because the protein and the pH both changed. And we heard a little bit about uh, proteins yesterday, complex proteins in, in HSA, and, and certainly we know there's lot to lot variation in these uh, 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 protein supplements and there's growth factor contamination and other factors. So I, I don't know that uh, this particular study did a very good job of controlling for the impact of culture media itself. So these are the sort of things that, that really make it difficult to uh, 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 say that culture media has a definitive impact on uh, mosaicism or mitotic errors in, in embryos. And so the questions arise if it, if it does, what component of the culture media would impact mitosis? Is there a specific ingredient or lack thereof between media that would be uh, causative? And if so, we'd, we'd want to address that in all the culture media, presumably. So could it be different, different levels of lactate? That's kind of a hot topic here with, with one commercial system. Different amino acids, we heard, you know, that's a big difference between single and uh, sequential medias. Or addition of growth factors, which has been a long uh, time controversial topic in our field. So, Certainly none of these studies have, have isolated it down to that level in terms of specific possible ingredients or lack of. So perhaps more likely, as I mentioned, the impact could be from other aspects of the culture system or a cumulative effect even. Is it how the media is used rather than the media itself? And as we'll see here in the next few slides, there are several other stressors that could be impacting cell development and function that could uh, have a plausible mechanistic connection to resulting uh, mitotic errors in, in aneuploidy. <clears throat> and so here is an example of that. Now, uh, I do want to note that this is in the oocyte, but the oocyte has uh, microtubules and microfilaments and chromosomes. Now it's, it's undergoing meiosis, but there are similar uh, structures uh, at work between meiosis and mitosis. And so here you can see that pH in mouse oocyte is, is the model, um, did impact spindle or retardants, uh, in the mouse oocyte, and the paper on the bottom, increased internal pH of oocytes was associated with loss of cohesion, which is important in chromosome separation and then subsequent segregation, and increased aneuploidy. So at least in the mouse oocyte model, you could come up with a plausible mechanism of pH impacting that meiotic spindle, which controls the, uh, the chromosomes. And so you could come up with a, a similar plausible mechanism uh, with the mitotic spindle. Uh, none of that data is currently available, but this is what some people might use to try to, to pose that as a possible cause. And so there's a, additional research on this, and again, like many things, it's not all indicating the same result. And so we had done some work over a decade ago now um, in, in Michigan, Gary Smith's lab, changing the pH of buffered media, not bicarb media, on mouse oocytes. We saw no difference in spindle retardants, so this would contradict what was shown in that RBM online paper, uh, some slight differences between, but we looked at pH 7.4 versus 7.8. We saw no impact on the meiotic spindle. <clears throat> there was no change in microtubule structures with internal pH changes over a wide range in hamster embryos. Um, importantly, neither of these uh, studies uh, uh, really gave um, information on the function of that meiotic spindle. So I think that's an important factor. This is all just a potential plausible mechanism, certainly not cause and effect. Um, and we do know that pH impacts microtubule assembly and disassembly in uh, brain mitotic cell lysates. So again, you could come up with a mechanism here, but far from, from uh, 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 proven. So another 
possible uh, stressor that we've heard now uh, about a couple times is oxygen. And so arguably low oxygen should be the standard uh, in your laboratories. It's not in all, but it really should be based on several decades of, of work. But oxygen can be a stressor through uh, reactive oxygen species and, and other mechanisms. And so this is uh, data from uh, the mouse, um, from Pat Hunt and Terry Hasshold, two very well-known researchers in, in the field. And they showed that non-destruction events in early cleavage divisions of the mouse embryo was impacted by oxygen concentration used during culture. So high oxygen during uh, mitotic cell divisions during embryo culture in the mouse led to increased rates of chromosomal non-destruction and presumably aneuploidy. Um, low oxygen culture, which we should again be using in our labs around 5% at least, if, if not lower, um, uh, was lower, more similar to those of the in vivo derived embryos. So this would suggest that high oxygen could be a stressor that could impact mitotic uh, cell division errors. <clears throat> but again, as uh, you'll see a common theme here, not everything uh, is gonna uh, be one-sided. Uh, there's a study out of NYU, again, very good group there, uh, rates of mosaicism influenced by oxygen levels during incubation. This was retrospective from Dave McCullough and colleagues. <clears throat> they showed no significant difference in human embryos in terms of mosaicism when cultured under high oxygen around 20% and low oxygen around <clears throat> 5%. Of note, you can see it was about a 4.3% difference, not significant. If you remember back to that prior abstract, 4% was uh, different. So again, I, when you put these things together, it's important to kind of look at that sort of information. Um, interestingly, uh, follow-up conversations with uh, Dr. McCullough, he said that they had additional data that suggested it could be significantly different. So oxygen is something we should uh, be aware of as a potential stressor in our labs. And then this is a study out of uh, CCRM with Mandy Katz uh, Jaffe uh, uh, in her group, um, kind of sort of combining two of these stressors, pH or CO2 levels and oxygen. This is a retrospective analysis. <clears throat> they had test donated human uh, uh, zygotes. They cultured them under purposely abnormal conditions, high oxygen and inappropriate uh, CO2. So they had a high pH and a high oxygen concentration to stress those. Small end, 15 blastocysts. She then took her, her existing data from our controlled em uh, embryos that were cultured under normal conditions, almost 3,000. <clears throat> Importantly, she sampled them differently. So that's a, a very important factor that is oft often overlooked. She quartered the entire blastocysts on that test group versus our normal clinical trophectin uh, biopsy of the other group. <clears throat> Point being, in these embryos under these conditions, there was a significant difference in rates of mosaicism or mitotic errors uh, between embryos grown under these controlled conditions and purposely stressful conditions of abnormal oxygen and CO2. So this could lead, lead credence to the impact of those two particular stressors in the culture environment. <clears throat> Wrapping things up here, Osmotic stress is another stressor in the lab that's become of relevance here lately with uninterrupted culture, dry incubation, and time lapse. Uh, there is some existing data uh, from John Kreitzer's group uh, from several years ago suggesting that osmotic stress could negatively impact the meiotic spindle uh, in the oocyte uh, for increases, significant increases in osmolality. There was an impact on the, the meiotic spindle. Whether this would be the case in the mitotic spindle is unknown and whether it would be uh, impacted by the comparatively minor changes in osmolality that we see through evaporation and other factors in our labs is unknown, but you could come up with a possible mechanistic uh, cause and effect. And then also temperature. So uh, uh, Dr. Poole, Rusty Poole is here in the audience and is probably one of the best people to talk on this particular topic. A lot of, of uh, to-do has been made about temperature and the impact on the meiotic spindle of the egg. We're gonna focus on the embryo here. Um, there are, are any number of possible concerns and, and questions about the true impact uh, of temperature on the meiotic uh, spindle. We know that spindles can disassemble and reassemble. We know we can freeze successfully eggs and embryos. You give uh, embryos or uh, eggs enough time and their spindle will reassemble. It takes about two hours uh, per our, our protocols. Um, so the point being, uh, this has been studied in the human. Richard Scott and his colleagues, very well designed study, controlled probably as well as you can control looked at 36 degrees versus 37 degrees. So a full degree, a measurable difference, not some minor 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 uh, temperature difference that can be hard to, to accurately measure. And so certainly a change in temperature uh, impacted embryo development, but they had no significant impact on uh, rates of aneuploidy. Now this study uh, wasn't able to look at rates of mosaicism, but here's at least some data that suggests temperature itself may not be impacting uh, aneuploidy in, in the lab. 
And then to wrap things up, <clears throat> to show that you, we can control these things in the lab, that not all labs are so drastically different that we're all seeing uh, these differing rates of mosaicism or, or embryo aneuploidy. This was preliminary data that we presented a few years ago here at ASRM uh, between 11 related labs. The goal being these labs were, were built to try to be as consistent as possible in terms of equipment, SOPs, quality control, controlling for oxygen, pH, temperature, osmolality, some of the stressors we've mentioned. <clears throat> and all of these labs sent their biopsy blastocysts to the same genetics lab, so controlling for that genetics lab component, and similar training in terms of biopsy technique and loading technique, so trying to control for those vari variables. And our data suggested no significant difference in rates of mosaicism between these 11 labs. So uh, the point being, if the lab is able to influence this, uh, we can influence it in a good way too, that it's not that uh, we're going to be uh, uh, you know, all varying 40% in our rates of, of embryo aneuploidy between facilities. So in conclusion, there are variables within the IVF laboratory that can impact embryo development and viability. Absolutely, we know that from a variety of, of uh, factors. There are several, several plausible mechanisms for how culture conditions might impact the spindle and resulting mitotic chromosome dynamics, and we talked about a few of these in the culture system, pH, osmolality, temperature, oxygen, perhaps culture media. <clears throat> but I think it's, uh, it's evident that it's difficult to determine the full impact of these culture conditions on this endpoint. There are other possible uh, explanations, as we mentioned, in terms of genetics labs and bioinformatics or even biopsy uh, technique and uh, cell handling. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jason, for that uh, very concise uh, summary of what uh, we know at this point about the relationship between laboratory protocols and practices and um, aneuploidy in human embryos. Uh, so it is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Nabil Arash. Uh, Nabil has 20 years of research experience in molecular genetics, both in preclinical and clinical settings. He has worked at several prestigious research centers, including the University of California, Berkeley, Sanford Burnham Medical Research Institute, and the University of California in Irvine. And he has numerous high-impact publications and a successful record in grant funding. Dr. Arash is the co-founder of Progenesis, our host, located in La Jolla. And uh, it's a leading genetics company using next-generation sequencing technologies for embryo testing. Dr. Arash was the first scientist to optimize and validate next generation sequencing for PGS and PGD. He continues to work on new emerging fields in IVF, including uh, spent culture medium testing. He has a PhD in molecular and cellular bio biology, and under his guidance, Progenesis uh, is at the forefront of MGS research technology. Uh, so, with that introduction, I would like to invite uh, Nabil to talk to us about the current status and future of reproductive genetics. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you so much for the, the introduction. Um, and so, today we're going to be talking about current status and future of reproductive genetics. And I'm going to try to be a little bit uh, um, brief because I have seen s wonderful presentations that are similar in some ways to what I have been, uh, you know, what I have uh, prepared. So this is the classical picture of where we, uh, we were, you know, a few decades and then uh, with the, with the um, uh, fish technology. And then we went to microarray technology, which was a quite an improvement um, 
in the, um, in the scope of technology, sensitivity, specificity, et cetera. And then 2015, 16 is where, where NGS uh, took place. So when we look at uh, current te uh, chemistries used for PGTA, and I don't know how to use the pointer. Hopefully that's the pointer. Uh, okay, I'm gonna escape the pointer. So <laughs> for whole genome amplification, so you have this random amplification that every lab uses these days. It's a relatively low resolution, but it gives you a whole scope of what happens in the chromosomes, right? If you have an extra copy, missing copy, then there is a chemistry uh, that is more targeted. Would you look at specific SNPs, specific spots in the genome? And that gives you also some sort of view, but the whole random genome gives you a little bit a bigger picture. Um, Santi will be talking about whole genome sequencing base per base, where you actually look at maybe 80% of the genome or, or, or higher. So when we look at uh, sequencing platform currently used uh, across the industry. So you have Illumina platform, Thermo Fisher platform. Some of the labs will be using SNP array. And then what we have not used so far is PAC Bio, which is a, a chemistry that gives you long reads, about 1,000 base pairs. So compare 1,000 to approximately 150, so about eight times more. Illumina gives you about 36 base pairs, so even shorter. But with nanopore, you can sequence 100,000 base pairs. So imagine the scale of um, a, you know, uh, sequencing a single molecule that have over 100,000. If you're looking, if you're testing human genome and amplified from a, a blood sample, you can reach millions of base pairs. So imagine what that will give you as far as you know, translocations and inversions and, mod and genome modifications. So we have not tapped into that yet. So some of the limitation we see is the resolution, right? Resolution is five to 10 million base. There are certain platform microarray that gives you a little bit better. Uh, we have worked on uh, triploidies. Tri triploidies is less than 1% of human embryos. Um, uh, XXY and XYY are detectable. Uh, the algorithms don't pick them up, but they are detectable. You can adjust the algorithm to, to make that call. The 69XXX are hard to detect because they are, it's like a three copy genome. It's exactly like a 46XX. But we have find ways of clustering the data and looking at more creative ways of mapping the data to be able to distinguish that uh, karyotype. And then, uh, as you guys know, the, in the course of IVF, there are clinics that wanted to know the, the you know, origin of the embryo, whether if it belongs to the couple, or it doesn't belong to the couple. It's a, it's a big decision for a clinic to transfer an embryo. With SNPs and with STR, STR stands for single tandem repeats. Those are repeated sequences happen in the genome that are used for paternity testing. So if you take two individuals in this room, they will have, and you look at one STR marker, they will have two different repeat number. So using those tools, you can actually identify the, whether the embryo belongs to the couple that you are transferring the embryo to. And um, you can also solve problems like maternal contamination, et cetera. So next point is invasive versus non-invasive PCTA, which I will talk about in a few moments. And the uh, last one is, if you have the ability to the whole genome, of course you can look at a lot of things, inversion, translocation, coping, gene copy number, et cetera. So mosaicism has been you know, addressed in many, many, many papers. Uh, Swain, uh, J Dr. Swain just made a, a, you know, a very nice presentation on, on mosaicism. I'm gonna approach it slightly from a different angle. So without giving you the introduction, you know what mosaicism is. When you look at uh, platform, sequencing platform, there are differences. And the way we know that, we will look at labs that are using NGS. And just by looking at the rate of mosaicism, I can tell if they are using Illumina or they're using Thermo Fisher. 
Um, and the answer to that is a little bit more complicated, but I can go into it. So we have done some modification to reduce the mosaicism rates by increasing the size of the read, of the sequencing read, because at the end, the noise, and I can, I can speak about this in a moment, the mosaicism has these artifact components, which is the majority of mosaic calls that we see, they're artifacts. And artifacts comes from a, a variety of places. They can come from the sequencing platform you're using because they are shorter read, the, they don't map to the genome the way longer reads do, and that gives you some noise that transcribes into mosaicism. We have seen mosaicism between labs, within the, lab, within the same lab, and, and so the, it, it's spanned from the genetic lab all the way to the IVF lab and the technology that is being used for that purpose. Here we're looking at 145 embryologists that use our platform. You can see mosaicism rates, rates ranging from 0.5 to 5%. So, you know, obviously, like Dr. Swain was saying, you can compare two different labs. They may have two different culture systems, different, some of the labs are more controlled than others. You will see differences. But we have also seen differences within the same lab between two embryologists, uh, a difference to that of, of three to four times higher. And, and that's, you know, tells me that the way the embryologist is doing the biopsy can also influence the mosaicism risk. If you are very conservative and you're taking a very small biopsy, then you're gonna get more noise in the data, which will be interpreted as mosaic. And so we looked at um, a clinical outcome from mosaic embryos. This is not a published data. Well, on the right-hand side is a published data, but on the graph is our internal data. We don't have a lot of embryos that, are, that have been transferred. So the data is small, but in blue, you see the implantation rates, clinical pregnancy, biochemical miscarriages. You look at the gray, that's mosaic transfers, and they are not too far, especially if you look at the pregnancy rate, 40 versus 48, not too far from the euploid class. And bear in mind, this is 2.5% mosaicism rate, so we, it's not like we are giving the clinics a lot of mosaics, they are working with a very narrow, uh, you know, uh, low rate of mosaicism, uh, low level of mosaicism, and, and uh, you can see they are, they're behaving uh, almost like a euploid class. So this is a study on miscarriages, analyzing miscarriages, short-term and long-term culture. They will take a POC tissue, then they will culture it, and they ask the question, uh, how can we turn this on? Say again? It's changing here, but not there. Well, I'm gonna keep talking to you guys. So, um, so in that uh, study, of miscarriage study, they looked at 1,000 patients. Then they take the POC tissue and they will culture it short term and long term. And then they ask the question, are there differences in karyotype? The differences are attributed to mosaicism, the way they define it. But when I look at uh, Jason's presentation, those differences can be also just stressors in the culture, in the culture system that you're using, right? Culture system can introduce um, stress in certain, uh, you know, in, in, in certain conditions. And so the rates of mosaicism that they found here was 3.5% based on short-term and long-term culture. So that study, 1,000 patients found 3.5%. So I think the mosaicism rate is way lower than 3%. The way, when we get uh, uh, re-biopsy of mosaic, mosaic calls, we get only 0.5% that are confirmed. That's what we see. So the point I'm trying to make here is, mosaicism does exist, but it's not that common. Um, and I'm gonna go into a, another slide. I'm sorry, I'm doing a virtual presentation here on my laptop. <laughs> but in this case, we've looked at the distribution of aneuploidy from chromosome one to chromosome 22 and X and Y. And we asked the question, what is the frequency of each aneuploidy in each chromosome, right? So we found that chromosome 15, 16, 21, and 22 are more common 
Why? I really don't know, but they're more common. There are, uh, maybe we, we can address this from evolutionary aspects or things like that, that makes those chromosomes more prone to aneuploidy. But the reality is, when you look at miscarriages in this study, chromosome 15, 16, 21, and 22 were higher. When you look at the population of embryos, they are higher. But when you look at mosaic uh, uh, calls or mosaic embryos, the distribution is flat, is noisy. And what that tells me is what we call mosaics are really just noise, mainly noise. Okay, back to the presentation. And awesome. Thank you. Okay, so just a couple of slides. So this is the distribution I was talking about that you see a random distribution in blue and then uh, the CVS and the embryo looks very similar with 15, 16, 21, 22 being more common. Now, uh, when we look at age, we don't see any impact. If mosaicism was a non-disjunction event due to errors with age, you would see more errors, right? But we don't see that. If anything, we, just, we see a slight decrease. That tells me that mosaicism is really not, uh, not as common. When we look at clinical outcome, this is from 185,000 embryos that we've tested, right? These are all the cases we have collected of miscarriages, reported miscarriages, that are due to mosaic embryos. So you can see we have collected literally six out of these, many, these big samples. That's how uncommon it is. And the percentages are ranging from 5 to 25 percent, and we have a 40 percent case for a mosaic XO. And we have a birth, two birth, uh, one with 25 percent trisomy 21, and the other one in XO. So back to the improvements. So this is just a diagram showing you how SNPs can be used to identify triploidy. So in a typical scenario, the SNPs are either mom or dad, so you will have either 100% uh, copy number of one SNP or 50%. But you, when you have a triploid, you have two from mom, one from dad, and two from dad, one from mom. So you get now the 66%, 33%, and then you get the 100% and 0%. So you see additional band when you are mapping the SNPs on the genome. This is one point um, in, in yesterday, um, we heard that if you don't believe in mitochondria, then you, you, you have to look at it twice. That you, have to, you have to look at mitochondria, whether if it's if something we should look at. I'm gonna give you my story about mitochondria. So, when we look at the my, mitochondria, is just a way of quantifying mitochondria in embryos. When we look at uh, the differences between euploid and anoploid in terms of mitochondria, do, do, does it tell us whether this embryo can be euploid or anoploid? We don't see differences. But when you look at the data from a embry uh, the embryo development uh, aspects, meaning that you're looking at day five and day six, and you're asking the question, okay, in day five, give me the best score, the best mitochondrial, because mitochondria decrease over time. So if you have very little, that means the embryo is growing very fast. So if you ask the question on day five, give me the lowest mitochondria, and on day six, give me the highest mitochondria, now you are looking at the impacts on development, right? You look at the fast developer development and very slow developments, right, in embryos, and you're adding the mitochondria on top of that. When you do double selection, you can see the clinical outcome being different from day five to day six or from high mitochondria to low mitochondria. And the reason behind the, that is when you look at general population without double selection, you get situation where the embryologists will grow the embryo to day six because that's how they practice. It's not necessarily because those embryos are slow at developing. So you get a lot of mixed bags where embryos are, they stay six days just because it's a normal practice in that clinic. And it's not really because they are slow at developing. So when you force the data to be segregated in this manner, then you start seeing more differences in outcome. Non-invasive has been the promise of PGTA. We all thought this is wonderful. We, can, we don't have to do any more biopsy. You have more media to work with. 
Uh, we've published a paper on spent media a few years ago. Um, the reality is when you look at papers right now, all the literature combined, the correlation is about 80%. So you can predict about 80% of the time if an embryo is euploid. About 10% of gender discrepancy, discrepancy, meaning that the embryo you think it's a female, but it turns out to be a male. And that is because we have a quite a good amount of maternal contamination that will overpower chromosome Y. So you have lots of Xs in, in the media that will over, overpower uh, XY, and you see more of a, a normal female pattern um, uh, rather. Uh, and so I think adding markers like STR markers and SNP markers will help us uh, identify when you have a maternal contamination so you can rule out that sample. What I'm gonna talk, uh, talk about in the next slide is how that spin media can be utilized for other purposes. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to look at spin media for metabolic profiling. So if you look at media itself without embryo growth, you're gonna see um, amino acid, you're gonna see uh, um, uh, serum albumin, albumin, you're gonna see some of the sugar and etc. cetera. So, um, and you can pretty much identify each component if you want. If you run it on a high resolution my spec, you can identify the peaks and you will tell, you can tell what you have in the media. What I like about this is when I look at Jason Swain presentation, them trying to control the oxygen and the CO2 and say, okay, stressors, whether stressors have an impact on euploidy, with these tests, you can actually look at the metabolites and, and, and look at the stressors, the actual stressors in the, in the metabolic profiling. So you can tell, okay, how much, you know, say you're looking at hydrogen peroxide or even oxygen or anything that you want to measure. It doesn't have to be only CO2 or oxygen. You can go beyond that. Molecules that are creating stress for the embryos. And it could be a really good way of uh, doing a QC in a laboratory. So imagine you have a mass spec access. You can tell if your lab is creating an environment that is very stressful to the embryos. That's very, very powerful. Beside that, you can look at, like yesterday we were uh, you know, hearing about the, the um, NADH and FAD, that is TC, TCA cycle, the glucose metabolism, and they were using images, and images give you that limitation that you only look at one thing, but with this mass spec, you can look at hormone, FSH, for example. We know that certain embryos will secrete FSH as a, as a, a, a normal mechanism of embryo developments being ready to, for implantation. We know that there are certain molecules that are used for invasion, for endometrial invasion. Those molecules, you can look at them in the mass spec data. This is how it looks like. On top, you have the media, and then on the bottom, you have the embryo growing in the media. If you try to look at this data 10 years ago, there would be no way of getting a, a good correlation with euploidian implantation rates. And the reason is because in the old fashioned way, you will look at peak one by one, try to make sense of it. But the reality is every embryo is unique. Although you may have certain signature of a good metabolism, the reality is no embryo is identical to another. And the only way to do that is you have to use artificial intelligence to look at patterns that are correlated correlated with, with implantation of pregnancy rates. So that's why we're going back with metabolic profiling, but this time we're using AI to solve the scoring and the identification of good, good embryos and bad embryos. So polygenic disorders, I think we heard yesterday um, a good presentation on how to use biobank data, genomic data, those are whole genome sequencing projects that are done on hundreds of thousands of patients. How can you reclassify those patients by fertility? In fertility, uh, for example, PCOS, and you can look at uh, you know, high rates of miscarriages, et cetera, and you can regroup, you reclassify them, and then look at the genome data and find markers that correlate with certain traits. And those markers can be utilized as a molecular test to uh, uh, you know, identify whether you know, a patient's 
uh, need to be stimulated one way or another. So you're using pharmacogenetic or genomics to uh, tailor and, and customize the treatment to the patients. Um, full genome sequencing, I'm not going to touch about this because we have a wonderful speaker, Dr. San Santiago Munier, who is going to talk about full genome sequencing. I'm just going to say that you, there is an enormous uh, amount of information you can extract out, there, out of the uh, embryos. And obviously, artificial intelligence has reshaped the way we think and the way we look at data. And, and then just imagine, so what we've seen yesterday, people talk, the, the presentation talking about embryo selection and looking at oocytes, and some of folks are looking at sperm selection using AI. But AI goes beyond embryos. We know that embryos is not the whole story. So you have the endometrium, you have uh, the patient side. So in an ideal world, you have an AMR system that captures every single detail of the treatment, the patient history, the age, BMI, the stimulation protocol, the level of FSH and LH, and if you can use that information to train the algorithms based on thousands and thousands of patients, you may be able to get a real-time um, uh, support for your practice. You may adjust the dose in real time. You may, you know, change the protocol. And that's the promise that, of the AI, the way I see it. From an embryo perspective, the way it would look like in our, in our testing, basically you will have the typical uh, reports, but in addition you will have, uh, you know, uh, kinetics of the embryo and you will have the AI score based on whatever you have designed as far as AI, and then there is a ranking system, and then you choose the embryo that is you employed, but also from an, an, a, an AI perspective is more correlated. So in the ideal world, to me, selecting, if we're gonna go into the non-invasive route, you have to look at genomics, metabolomics, and you have to look at the embryo images, and you have to incorporate the cycle information. It's gonna be a a more of a, a, a global picture of looking at it. So I'm gonna skip. You're gonna look at you know, all these things in combination in one picture, and then I think that's what would make uh, you know, genera next generation IVF a lot more you know, uh, uh, efficient as far as outcome. And going back, so we talked about artificial intelligence, lab automation, uh, Jose yesterday gave a wonderful presentation on lab automation. I think this is going to continue to grow uh, as we see microfluidics, we see automation of the biopsy. I think tracking of uh, vitrification and, and, and wireless technology, all that is going to come into play where there are less need for manual work and embryologists will focus more on data and will focus more on looking at systems and, and monitoring rather than doing the work. And um, so we have accumulated 185,000 embryos. So we're looking at the big data and then 150, 120 clinics. We got uh, about 300 physicians, more than 150 embryologists. And, and the, the goal is to try to to provide the clinics with some data to use. So for example, you can compare different stimulation protocol. You can, you can uh, look at your embryology team and say, okay, where do I see differences in rates of mosaicism and anoploidy and stuff like that. So uh, an unlimited uh, number of possibility. And with this, I was told time is up, and thank you so much. This is my team, I appreciate it, thank you. <laughs> Well, uh, up next, uh, I have a pleasure to present Dr. Santiago Muni. Dr. Muni received his PhD in genetics from Pittsburgh University in 1993, de developed the first pre-implantation genetic test for aneuploidy as PGT director of IMMS 
in St. Barnabas, he developed PGT for translocations and demonstrate that PGT reduces miscarriage and increase implantation rates. Dr. Monet has published more over 260 uh, scientific publications, received SART and ASRM prizes papers for many years. In 2001, founded Ripple Genetics with Jack Cohen and David Sablon. And Ripple Genetics was acquired in two, uh, 2016. In 2011, he co founder with Alex uh, Bisgano uh, Recombine, which offered genetic carrying screening and was acquired, acquired in 2016. Dr. Monet we will speak on whole genome sequencing of embryos. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Santiago Monet. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I thought I was retired from PGT, but then I met uh, Nick Murphy and, and he dragged me back in. Um, and basically, um, when, we, when we finish at, um, at, uh, at Cooper, uh, we have developed most of the techniques right now. Nothing has changed, well, apart from polygenic gene scores maybe. Um, but the only thing that was left uh, to analyze in the embryo was the novel mutations. So um, finally, I think that uh, Nick Murphy has developed this, this uh, test that I think it can be used for, for that purpose. Uh, my disclosures, I'm currently the chief innovator officer at uh, Overture. I don't see my slides here, so I'm gonna change this. This is better. <laughs> um, so also I'm a founder of uh, Homo Health Ventures, which is an incubator of, of companies uh, related uh, to um, ART. And uh, as, as it's been mentioned, I've been in this field of PGT for a while. Um, there are, um, Nabil has done a, a great uh, summary of, of the status of PGT before, uh, but I just to go uh, over again, uh, which repetition it's good sometimes. Uh, so as you know, there are uh, several different uh, methods uh, or indications for PGT. Uh, the most common use, 90% of the PGT cases right now are PGTA. Uh, and for that, usually uh, we are using low coverage sequencing. Uh, although you would need SNP arrays, um, sorry, a SNP detection if you want to uh, detect uh, polyploidies. Uh, then we have um, structural abnormalities that is done basically with the same platform as PGTA. Although again, you would need SNP arrays, sorry, SNPs, uh, to differentiate normal from, from carriers. And then we have PGTM for monogenic diseases that you, you need a, a SNP array platform. Uh, and, and by that you do a haplotyping. So basically you face uh, the origin of of uh, each chromosome, and with that you can detect the mutation, and it's basically a pan, um, pan test for, for uh, any genetic disease, although uh, current SNP technology doesn't cover very well the whole, um, the whole genome, so sometimes uh, you have difficulty with this system to, to find um, the mutation. Um, Polygen gene scores that were covered uh, yesterday and as I said, the only thing that it needs, um, that, that we need to develop is uh, PGT for the novel mutations. And for that, you, you really need to do, uh, to uh, analyze the whole genome because uh, these novel mutations are not uh, present in the parents. Uh, well, they are not present in, in the blood of the parents, they are present in, in the gametes. 
and therefore you cannot detect them. Um, you, you don't know what's going to be affected until you do a host genome sequencing of the embryos. So PCTA and also PCT for structural abnormalities. As you know, uh, there's an increase in chromosome abnormalities with advanced maternal age, and most of this is, is produced by an euploidy. Um, and we said some time ago that uh, if we select uh, for an euploidy, we will improve uh, implantation rates. Uh, this is uh, basically true by, by if you look at uh, when you transfer a, a euploid embryo, they more or less implant equally well at any age uh, compared to non-PGT. Uh, there have been a bunch of uh, publications right now, uh, and most of those uh, randomized trials uh, in patients over 35 show uh, an improvement in results. But however, this is not the case for patients uh, under uh, 35. Uh, this could be for, for several reasons, because you still see 20% chromosomal normalities uh, or more in, in young patients, uh, but it could be uh, the, the study design in some of these studies. For instance, um, they, they use platforms, as Nabil said, that may produce more uh, mosaic uh, signals, and those embryos at the time of those studies were not transferred, so you are eliminating there uh, maybe 20% of the embryos that could have been transferred. Uh, and those, uh, there, is, um, there is a higher rate of mosaicism in, in younger patients, so that, that could be one of the reasons. And the other could be uh, the effect of the biopsy. Uh, still, if you look at SART data, uh, even in, in uh, young patients, you see a significant improvement in, in results. And now uh, PGTA is performing over 50% of cycles in the US as the later the late um, SAR data shows. So basically, PGTA imp increases uh, implantation rates per transfer, reduces miscarriage rates, um, um, it uh, increases live birth rate per transfer, reduces time to pregnancy, and enables confident single embryo transfer. Obviously, what it does not do is to create euploid embryos. Uh, it's a selection technique, so if you don't have any, uh, you, you cannot improve anything. And obviously, it does not improve cumulative pregnancy rates, because if you transfer every embryo one by one, you should get uh, the same results, or worse, if you're doing some, some damage uh, on the embryo during the biopsy. PCTM uh, has gone through uh, an evolution of, of several uh, generations. At the beginning, we just uh, detecting the mutation and link markers. Uh, the problem is that if you don't have uh, link markers that are close to, to the mutation, then you could have, you could have misdiagnosis by uh, recombination. Uh, the second generation is karyomapping, uh, in which you're phasing uh, the, the, the chromosomes, and, and that with that you can identify uh, if the chromosome comes from um, one parent uh, or the other, and in which chromosome of the parents, and then you can know if that chromosome uh, has the mutation or not. And uh, the next generation, it's, it's basically sequencing and haplofacing. So now there is um, a tendency, there is a bunch of papers uh, trying to combine all these techniques into one. Um, and basically, um, the problem that we have uh, is, is the, the amplification. So there are several methods of, of amplification. Um, the, the most common use for copy number is um, basically PCR amplification and, and like methods like surplex and picoplex, but those are very noisy. Uh, you cannot detect very well SNPs. Uh, the other is uh, basically um, amplification uh, target to SNPs, such as uh, MDA and REPLIG, uh, but those are not very good for copy number. And then now there are uh, new methods such as Malbach, Lianti, uh, PTA, uh, that seems to, to be much more faithful in, in, um, in detecting SNPs and also copy number. Um, so th there are several methods now uh, for haplotyping, basically, uh, again, identifying the chromosome uh, of, of the parents that has the mutation. Um, you could have uh, carrier mapping. Uh, haplorhythmesis, um, all, all of those uh, that use SNPs, uh, other use sequencing, and other methods use a combination of both, such as PGT-complete or PGT-seq. 
Some of them are clinically used, uh, although uh, there are not a lot of data uh, on it, and especially there is not a lot of data uh, on, on using it for all these indications at the same time. So, uh, for instance, you have uh, low pass sequencing. It can detect an aneuploidy and, and mosaicism, but it cannot detect um, polyploidy, balance translocations, inherited mutations, and so on. Uh, you have a SNP arrays, uh, which um, they, they detect poorly mosaicism. Uh, they don't detect the mutations, but could detect all the other things that we want. Um, sorry, I cannot even read this. Um, <laughs> Can, can I see the, the screen here? Because I cannot see it. OK. Um, and, and basically, uh, then you have all these um, haplophasing uh, methods uh, that can detect uh, everything, with exception of, of the novel mutations. So for the novel mutations, we really need to sequence the whole, the whole genome. So why we want to detect the novel mutations? Uh, well, the novel mutations, uh, they, they, as I said, uh, you cannot detect them in the parents. Uh, you have, they are originated in the gametes. And uh, in, on average, we have uh, 74 the novel mutations per embryo. Uh, some of them, some of them uh, will be uh, pathogenic. And um, the only way to detect them is by whole genome sequencing. And we want to detect them because, uh, in addition that they, they increase with paternal age, uh, for instance, you would see that there is a risk of 3.5 times uh, autism with, with advanced paternal age, 27% uh, risk of polar, bipolar uh, disorders. Um, these are very severe um, mutations uh, that we want to detect. Uh, Usually, they are not affected by, by lifestyle, like polygenic genes score. So, and, and they are much more common uh, than inherited mutations. So really, there are 10 times more uh, de novo mutations affecting babies uh, than inherited diseases. But we're not detecting them right now. Um, they could be uh, single point mutations, but also they could be copy number vari uh, variants. Uh, those are uh, larger mutations. They involve 500 base pairs or more. Uh, and, and about uh, 1 to 2 percent of concessions carry one of them uh, that are between 100 kb and, and 10 uh, megabases. Uh, obviously, some of those will, will be uh, detrimental. Interestingly, the more copy number variations you have per embryo, uh, the higher the, the predisposition to have autism. And then, uh, as I said before, uh, yes, an aneuploidy can detect um, it's, it's causing um, this decrease in, in implantation potential. But really, after we, we select embryos for, for an aneuploidy, you still have 30% or more embryos that don't implant. Uh, some of these could be caused by, by the transfer procedure, uh, but obviously there has to be a proportion of those that are produced by, by uh, the NOVA mutations. Uh, there have been three methods right now uh, to, to assess uh, the NOVA mutations. The first, uh, we developed it uh, by, with Peter Setal from uh, Complete Genomics. Uh, this was a platform. It doesn't exist anymore. But basically, um, it, um, it sequence, so you fragment the DNA, and then you sequence each fragment in the, independently. Uh, so, and then you can compare them. So if you have um, artifacts, then you would see, uh, you would detect these artifacts. So it, it was a way of uh, eliminating the problem of the amplification. The other one is by Chietal. It's been published uh, recently using a new uh, amplification method, PTA. And then uh, Nick Moore Fietal uh, developed a, a platform um, basically using bioinformatics to just using regular uh, amplification at high depth, 30 to 50x, uh, to clean all the artifacts that are produced by, by the amplification. Oof, what's going on? <laughs> Something happened here. Um, so the first, as I said, the first method was by Peter Zetal. Um, it uh, denatured the DNA and then dispersed it uh, into 384 wells. 
uh, about 5% of, of, of the DNA of, of the embryo was in each well. Then you amplify it, barcode it, et cetera, uh, and, and then you compare it. Um, and this was done at, at 23 uh, coverage. And uh, it found uh, hundreds, sorry, thousands of uh, de novo mutations, uh, of which uh, about 30%, sorry, 30 of them were at the time identified as, as pathogenic. Um, here, it didn't develop uh, filters to, to select um, which one were pathogenic or not. So um, basically, this was just the method, uh, how, to, how to do it. I think it was very neat. Uh, but then you need a lot of bioinformatics uh, on the back end, which at the time didn't exist, um, to clean the data. Uh, the, the other method is uh, primary template uh, direct amplification. Um, basically, it uses MDA. Uh, but then it adds uh, an exonuclease um, that uh, makes smaller amplicons. Uh, you are amp amplifying uh, more of the original amplicon. So if there is a, an error in, in, the, in the amplified product, you don't read it. Uh, so this reduces the, the errors of amplification. Uh, and it has much higher fidelity than, than uh, other methods. Uh, if you could see on the bottom, um, one method compared to the other, uh, one is much more noisy MDA than, than PTA. Um, with that, you, you cover about 90% of the genome uh, very well. And they, they've done just a couple of, of experiments with embryos, uh, so two biopsies uh, versus whole genome. Uh, versus the whole embryo, and, and they got uh, 96 genome uh, coverage at 14 depths. Uh, again, they detect uh, 3 million uh, SNP variations. 96% uh, of them were concordant with the rest of the embryo, still 70,000 uh, discordances. <laughs> um, and, uh, but uh, they were repeated uh, in both biopsies. It, can detect an aneuploidy, inherited and de novo mutations, uh, polygenic gene scores, and so on. Again, uh, with, then you need a, a filtration method uh, to, to, uh, to know what to do with these 7,000, uh, 70,000 SNP variables. So uh, this brings us to, uh, to Murphy et al. Uh, method. Uh, basically, it, it uses a regular MDA. Uh, and then it sequences the parents at 30 depths and the embers at 50 depths. Uh, and then it has a, a bunch of filtration methods uh, to detect fast positives. And then uh, once you have uh, these de novo mutations identified, uh, then it annotates them uh, with 50 different uh, sources uh, just to uh, report only the ones that are going to be uh, detrimental and pathogenic. Uh, it can detect the novel mutations, inherited mutations, and APLD translocations, uh, basically everything. Uh, this, this is just a, a graphic of, of some of these filters that, that they use. Uh, this is for, um, for uh, uh, SNP defects uh, with less than 10 kb, and this is for more than 10 kb. And, and then uh, uses all these uh, databases to, to annotate these mutations. Uh, and all this is, is, um, is an algorithm that, that he's using. And basically, without uh, his system, you, you get uh, between 200 and 500 kb false positives, so more than, than with PTA. Uh, obviously, we want to try PTA uh, to see if you can reduce it and then apply this filtration. Uh, obviously, this is way too high, um, and all these errors are, are the typical ones produced by, uh, by MDA. But with uh, his filtration method, you, you can decrease these false positives by, by more than 90%. Um, the, the validation that he's used so far is um, use uh, genome in a bottle. This is a very known, uh, well-known uh, genome. It's been studied um, in depth. Uh, and then compare the genomic DNA to amplified DNA uh, and assess. Um, well, then you, you, you do the analysis, um, and the now mutations are 
um, are calculated uh, before filtering, uh, but before annotation, and then annotation happens. Uh, also, what they do uh, once you have identified this denial mutation, uh, you can reconfirm it uh, by Sanger. Uh, so you have a, a, second, um, a second detection of the mutation. So um, we calculated uh, the positive predictive value, negative predictive value, sensitivity, and so on. Um, I'll, I'll show you now. Well, this is how we calculated it, obviously. And so for positive predictive value, uh, we, we had a 98% and 93% correlation um, with genome in a bottle. So here we're comparing genomic DNA to non-filter, so before the, fil uh, the filtration, and then uh, the genomic screen filtering. Uh, for negative predictive value, uh, it's, we have a 99.992%. Uh, uh, for sensitivity, uh, 92%. Um, and for, for the SNPs, and 84% for um, indels. Specificity, again, very high, 99.998. And um, for accuracy, again, 99.997. Uh, and then false uh, discovery rate, uh, about 2.93. And false positive rates, 0.2%. Uh, so this is in, in summary for, for SNPs and, and indels. So it, it's very, very highly accurate, but then once you have, you detect an embryo and you say, well, this is abnormal, has this, this uh, de novo mutation, you can then, uh, by Sanger, uh, reconfirm. You don't need to do a biopsy, you're just reconfirming with Sanger. So you have a second um, point of, of analysis to confirm the, the mutation. Um, so, for instance, as I said, uh, with pre-annotation, so before all these filters, you have 2,000 to 3,000 uh, de novo mutations, uh, but after the filtration, you only have 1.17 pathogenic de novo mutations uh, per sample. And after that, uh, as I said, uh, you, you could still do another more stringent criteria, uh, about the penetrance of the disorder, uh, its inheritance, age of onset, and so on, uh, and report it or not, if it's, let's say, it's, it's um, uh, um, late onset uh, disease, maybe you don't want to report that, uh, and then you can retest it uh, by Sanger. So it's not that um, from a, a whole cohort of embryos, uh, everything is gonna be abnormal, um, basically, some of those will be pathogenic, but maybe it's, it's not so, um, so important. Everybody has defects here, right? Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, we need now uh, to, what we need to do is, is obviously um, do more cases. Um, also, what, um, obviously, this is going to be expensive. Um, so what we, we will do is first to do PGTA, so anything that it's normal, uh, then you can do a PGTA with whole genome sequencing. Uh, and the cost is, is uh, decreasing day by day. Right now, the, uh, this new machine by, by Illumina, uh, it's, uh, it's providing the, the Nova Seek X, it's providing uh, genomic sequencing, whole genome sequencing for, for $200. Uh, so um, if you, Count the, the cost of a PGTA, 100 bucks, um, and, and then this one, 200 bucks, is not so expensive at the end of the day. So, next steps. Sorry, this is in, not in the right order. Um, so, we, we want to, uh, there are still several, sorry, let's pass all of them. So, there are still several things that we want to do. So, we want to try different amplification methods to see if we can improve even more the accuracy. Um, do experiments with, between biopsies and a whole genome, uh, sorry, and whole embryo. Uh, obviously, we're going to do sang Sanger concordance. Um, and, uh, it says. <laughs> and define better the indications. Uh, so, obviously, one of the, well, I see at least two or three populations that will be at the beginning indicated for that. Uh, one, it's uh, advanced paternal age. 
because the no-mutations increase with advancing paternal age. Um, consanguineous populations, for instance, Middle East, um, that will be very uh, useful there. Uh, even if you have, let's say, if you do uh, PGT for monogenic diseases there, uh, because there could be the no mutations, you would not detect that the no mutations. So if you're transferring um, uh, um, a recessive, or sorry, if you transfer uh, an embryo that has one of the mutations but not the other, uh, there could be still a denoma mutation there. So uh, for, for uh, these consanguineous groups of people, uh, this will be very uh, indicated, and obviously later on, uh, everybody. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, there are now many tests that, that could do comprehensive PGT. Uh, but for the novel mutations, the only way to do it is uh, with whole genome sequencing. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, specifically uh, very technical questions, please uh, contact uh, Nick Murphy, who's the developer of, of the test. Thank you. Thank you very much, Santi. Yes, wonderful. Our speakers have now joined us on the podium. Uh, this was a, a quite a thought-provoking, uh, somewhat controversial <laughs> session. So I invite everyone to now uh, examine the, <laughs> this the speakers and test them on what, uh, what they said uh, by asking questions. And I might, as you think about your questions, I'm going to ask a question of, of everyone. Uh, I wonder how, whether this uh, reliance on mosaicism data to determine the role of the laboratory uh, in uh, generating aneuploidy in human embryos is justified. Um, and I say that based on what all of you have presented, but especially Nabil, uh, there has been so much discussion about mosaicism, and its uh, well, uh, its relevance, um, and uh, the data that Jason presented almost exclusively relies on mosaicism, uh, which you say is actually not frequent. Uh, and uh, many of those calls uh, have to do with the platforms and the interpretations rather than the existence in embryos and uh, the frequency. So what do you think? Uh, Jason, I think maybe you can give us your opinion and then Nabil. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. So I think we can be our own worst enemy. Right? We're always looking to do better. Let's do better. Let's, we've got a new technology. Let's use it to try to improve. So the intentions are good, but you know, certainly the folks here on the stage are, are more familiar with the various arguments and concerns about mosaicism. I'm, I'm aware of I, I here at the meetings, but th that's the end point that's out there. So you know, my data was using that, but I agree 100%. Uh, I, I didn't talk about the impact of the platform or the bioinformatics but we know biopsy technique and, and we've got some internal data that says how you handle the biopsy itself and the resulting quality of the DNA that, that Mandy gets in our lab. She'll say, I've got this me messy signal. Well, is that being called mosaic? Is that being called aneuploid? Is she, she calls it no result and tells us to go back and, and re-biopsy it, which is a whole nother, whole nother thing. So agree 100% how useful is that data, but it's there. And so from a lab perspective, I guess to downplay it, I say, well, okay, let's assume it's true. Let's make sure we go back and, and really pay attention to our QC. There's no harm in that. 
Let's make sure our temperature is a tight range, make sure our pH is a tight range. Is it actually the case? I think that's the tough question. And, and I, I, as we heard yesterday, there's a lot of embryo plasticity. We know embryos seem to want to develop. Um, we're getting a lot of good pregnancies. We've gotten better over the years. So I personally don't feel like we are uh, causing antiploidy in these embryos from what we're doing in the lab, w within reason. I mean, if, if you have horrific embryo culture conditions, you're probably not going to get blastocysts. So I don't know that we're truly growing uh, abnormal blastocysts. But, you know, I could be proven wrong for sure. Thank you. Nabil, do you have something to add? Yeah, so when I look at the data, we have tested 185,000 embryos, right? So when I look at the data overall, and then I'm trying to map where the source is, the source of mosaicism, the embryologists contribute as much as, you know, 5%, right? But when you look at mosaicism we get uh, across labs, they go up to 20%. So there must be other places where mosaicism is coming from. And when I say mosaicism, I say artifact, basically. So 5%, up to 5%, and then within the lab, the same lab, the same, then, you, so, so one must be culturing system and, and control environments, right? So that's what Jason is saying. But the other one is biopsy and tubing. That has also some impact because we saw differences within the same lab, just six, five or six embryologists, and you see two that have substantially higher rates than others. And that's where I think having access to that data, you can cross-train them and, and you can solve. But the entire lab is not contributing more than 5% to, in, my, in our data, right? The other percentage is coming from the, plat the NGS platforms and algorithms that are being used. Um, and, and other things. So it's a combination of multiple factors. And the lab has only control of what they do. And that's why I say it's probably 5% of the whole, you know, mosaicism rate that we see. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Rick. Which is why we need to stop calling these embryos mosaic. Honestly, Jason, so I appreciate what you say, and it's great. Yes, culture conditions will influence all sorts of stuff, including the rate of growth. Are the trophectoderm cells dividing more quickly? That is what's giving you mitotic errors. But to keep saying, and therefore we have this many mosaic embryo. So the biopsy has an intermediate copy number. I think that would be the most accurate way of saying it. But if you say, okay, the biopsy is mosaic, so uh, there, that's okay, but to keep saying we change the conditions and we see a difference in embryo mosaicism, no, that is not embryonic mosaicism. And I think that's, that's really what bothers me in the way that this is being presented. I, we, we need to keep looking at it, and I agree with everything that you said. If every one of those quotations that you had had said <laughs> mosaic biopsy or intermediate copy in the small biopsy that we take. You Any agree. You agree. We are oh, no, I agree. I mean, I, I read the paper with you and Nathan uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah, intermediate copy number would be a, uh, a more PC appro uh, term, right? So, and, and, and uh, again, people here have debated this topic more than me with soccer balls and, and other <laughs> things. Um, I, I don't disagree at all. Hmm. Questions? Frosty, I think. Yes. Uh, Jason, I, a really well-rounded talk. I appreciate it. You know, I was looking at, at uh, the data of Harriet Swearman from, from Sydney uh, with uh, the pH effect on, the, on spindle dynamics, and then also looking at your paper with Gary at Michigan. You guys looked at pole-to-pole -pole length, as I recall. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd have, to have to go back. Yeah, well, um, okay, well, you we did. the pole <laughs> scope to measure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, I read it. You did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, but Harriet looked actually through polarizing microscopy. She looked at uh, the dissolution of the spindle uh, via a change in retardance. So uh, I, it's just two different techniques. And I wonder if it really isn't a technical uh, issue between the two studies and, and not really the, the outcome, the pH-related outcome. I, I think it, she showed very clearly 
that you can disassemble and reassemble as a function of pH, and at least in the mouse oocyte. And I don't know how appropriate a model that is for mitosis, but nonetheless, I think it just may be a methodological difference. Yeah, and, and even we, we had access to the pulse scope for a brief period of time when, when we did that, and I was working with a, um, a medical student, so you know, trying to give them uh, some room to run with it. But e even that technology, right? I mean, you focus up and down, you play with the intensity. Uh, one could argue that it could be a very subjective assessment in terms of spindle retardance. How well controlled is it? Uh, but agree 100%. It, they, and it didn't look at function either, right? So we know that that spindle uh, can assemble and disassemble. And uh, so even slight temperature variations, if you're not controlling for that, is the impact really the pH? Or did you know, did you not have your temperature stage warmed to the exact same temperature this day or this treatment versus the prior day, uh, subsequent day? So uh, hard to control all those, but it does start giving a plausible mechanism for sure. And, and on a temperature note, I just say that, that egg handling temperature and culture temperature are two totally different animals. And I think Kathy Hong and, and, uh, and Mohammed Fazi have shown you know, pretty elegantly that, that culture temperature does have a, a dramatic influence. Uh, handling is a completely different issue. Uh, yeah, extended, right? Culturing for six or seven days, much different than handling for five, 10, 20 minutes, yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, any other questions? Well, uh, can I do yes. a remark? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in, in our paper, uh, actually, when we were comparing egg donors, it was an euploidy that was the difference. Exactly. It was not mosaicism. Exactly. And an euploidy, it, it, you have to induce it in, on the egg. Okay? Yeah. Uh, and the embryo doesn't have anything to do with the egg. Uh, That's correct. So um, <laughs> we, uh, I, we haven't discussed here, but obviously hormonal stimulation has to have an impact on that. And we published a paper showing that uh, the levels of HMA, um, um, one of the hormones was, yeah, mm -hmm. HMA, um, was related to that. Obviously, there is. Uh, it was very difficult to do that that um, that study because it was not control. It was just an indication that that could be one of the things. And then later papers have not confirmed it, uh, so it, it, it needs to be a uh, well done design yeah. study. But I think the hormone stimulation could have an effect. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, it was HMG, I'm sorry, the, the dosage. Um, it's your luck. <laughs> uh, so I, I, w I wanted to, uh, Santi, put you on the spot uh, and ask you this question. So before NGS came, uh, came to uh, be the, the main uh, method of analysis, we said that uh, the, the reason for failed implantation of pregnancy after PGT was mosaicism. And in fact, I remember a paper that maybe you published with uh, uh, Jamie Griffo uh, from NYU uh, when you did those first series of NGS after, after array CGH was kind of pushed out. Uh, and it strikes me that you now are arguing, or at least that's what I heard, that the reason for the lack of improvement in outcomes after PGT in young patients is that we are <laughs> excluding mosaics that could be euploid. So, so which is it? <laughs> well, no, it's, it's um, so... The problem was that at the time of those studies, uh, mosaic embryos were basically called abnormal, right? Mm -hmm. And they were not transferred in any of these studies. Now we know that, especially if you have 50% um, or less abnormal cells, they implant equally well uh, than, than uh, euploid embryos, uh, which we didn't know until very recently, uh, Kapal Wojtal, for instance. Um, and also, we have to consider that um, most of the, the low rate mosaics um, that uh, when we transfer them, we, we saw that they implant less than euploid embryos. Those were in cases in which there was only that type of, that embryo, the only mosaic embryos were present, 
uh, otherwise you would transfer a euploid embryo. And those embryos could have something special uh, in common, um, which could be, well, it's a self-selected population, right? They could have worse morphology than the rest. Um, the, the biopsy could have been, could have been botched, um, mm -hmm. something. Um, when, when you do uh, the country, the, the study that Capalbo did, in which um, they didn't um, they didn't classify the mosaics as mosaic, they classified them as normal no. or abnormal, so it was basically a non-selection study. Uh, then they found out that um, in, in a non-selected population, um, the, the ones that, are, that have less than 50% abnormal cells implant more or less equally well as, as euploid embryos. Um, so what was the question? No, I <laughs> <laughs> You really are jet lagged. No, maybe I wasn't clear, but no, I think I. I Sorry, I think I'm so jet lagged. It's nine hours difference. <laughs> I, I think uh, you explained it. I, I just uh, think that um, it's a little bit of a shift in the way yeah. the argument is presented. Mm -hmm. And. Um, I, I think as we know more. Yeah. The arguments change in favor of the data. Mm -hmm. And five, six years ago, there was all the papers about mosaicism. And then people have started to transfer mosaic, mosaic embryos. They've started to see the results. Then, you know, with time, it became obvious that there are artifacts there. Right. But, you know, in science, that's how it always have works. You know, you have, you establish a hypothesis based on what you have, data you have, but that hypothesis may change over time. Uh, also, the, the message, oh, sorry. The, the message was you should not uh, compare uh, a mosaic embryo with a, an aneuploid embryo. You shouldn't call it abnormal, you should call it a third thing. Mm. Uh, at the time, we thought this could be mostly real. Mm. Now we know that there is a lot of um, artifacts there. Nice. Uh, but definitely you cannot count it as abnormal uh, because some of them, uh, well, now a bunch of them uh, implant equally well as, as euploid embryos. That, that was the message because you have some character out there that it's comparing that all of those are abnormal, then you transfer and I had babies. Well, because those were mosaic. If you look at the ones that were really an euploid, mm -hmm. they never implant no. or you have a, an abnormal baby. So you should not... Uh, put them in the same basket as abnormal embryos. That, that was the, the message at the time. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, you cut. Another. <laughs> another. Okay, I'm oh, just, I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so I think like, the take home message is obviously don't stress out your gametes, right? Um, it totally impacts things. So my question's super, I guess, basic. Um, Traditionally, when we handle on the bench top, you know, retrieval and um, ICSI and biopsy, we tend to use um, MHM or modified handling media. And some labs are starting to push more to using um, equilibrated, you know, culture media. And, I, and they're saying that it's less stressful on the embryos or eggs. And we're still trying to, you know, obviously keep in mind, keep your dish out as short as possible. And I was just wondering, Jason, if you've looked into any of that, if that stresses or doesn't stress as much? Yeah, so not specifically. I, uh, in our labs, we use isolettes because that's what they had uh, when I was training. Isolette was a swear word, so. It uh, is a swear word. Yeah, so, so when I had to use them, I uh, wasn't a huge fan. I got used to them, and they've gotten more ergonomically friendly over the years, and they're built specifically for what we do, so they've gotten easier to use. But I worked in labs for years on a warmed bench top with uh, heaps buffered media, and it had fantastic outcomes because generally you're using a cumulus oocyte complex and there's an amount of protection from those surrounding cumulus cells. Um, uh, people have bell jars, there's other things you can do, but if you're working with bicarb buffered media with no oil overlay in an open setting, you don't have a ton of time. So if you are concerned about stress, pH will change without a doubt uh, in a very short amount of time. But if you use oil overlay or if you have a, a bell jar, if you use heaps buffered media, that, I guess the, the concern would be in terms of stress, uh, uh, a difference in bicarb concentration would really be the primary, if not only difference, between an MHM and a, 
in a similar media with without heaps or mops. And heaps or mops themselves aren't supposed to be cell permeable based on the, the literature, shouldn't be toxic to cells based on all the, the research I've done. Um, there's some emerging less than ideal data um, from a, a recent uh, graduate student saying an injection of uh, heaps or mops into the oocyte could be problematic. That kind of contradicts some of the earlier studies that have been out there. Um, so the point being, I think, you know, you have to work within your system. Heaps buffered media is, or mops buffered is probably going to be safer than not using so. Bicarb concentrations can have an impact, but if it's brief exposures and you get them back into the, the incubator and the other uh, environment, probably not as impactful. And, and to me, we know um, uh, improper pH can cause other issues, uh, and those media have been used successfully. So I, I would say if you're concerned about heaps or mops, extracellularly, I, I'm not entirely sure where that concern would come from based on the literature, but don't just change to bicarb only without having the proper system in place, which means isolate or gassed bell jar or oil overlay. Um, I, I think from Rusty's lab and several other labs, you can have fantastic outcomes using heaps or mops. Um, you just have to do it correctly, and, and if you don't want to use it for whatever reason, great. Make sure you have the equipment and the resources to use a bicarb buffered media appropriately to, to not trade one concern for for another. We had another question. Yes. Uh, I have, uh, as a lab director, concerns about these high mosaics because we keep throwing them because the patients are informed that they are at high risk and they ask us to discard. And usually the physicians guide these kind of thoughts to the patients. So what kind of liabilities are we expecting to face in the future? I think this is a very important question to answer. If a couple of years later are, you know, if something comes up, these 30% are normal or something like that, what are we going to do? We are discarding them. Anybody likes to? We don't have the attorney here. Where, where is he? <laughs> <laughs> we lost our attorney. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so yeah, are they discarding mosaics? Yeah, don't discard. What? I mean, I, our, our approach has been, why call it mosaic if, if you're not going to use it? Isn't the entire purpose to not call it abnormal and discard it? And the, the idea is when the physicians are informing our patients, I'm working with like 13 different physicians at the same time, so none of them encourages to trans, you know, they discuss the low mosaics, but they strongly discourage the high mosaics continuously. And at the end of the day, we are charging a lot of money per yearly storage, and lots of people are discarding these things, thinking that they're abnormal. So there is, a, I think, information, misguidance at this point, because it doesn't, it, you know, the, the consent forms doesn't really cover the entire content, and no one can blame a patient that's been informed by a verbally with a physician about a high mosaic. And then what if they come after a couple of years, after a couple of publications? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, th I think that's counseling, right? We, yeah, that's, there's that's labs who will transfer abnormals and say they get babies. So I think it comes down to counseling. For us, if it's called mosaic, we treat it as euploid. Because otherwise, why call it mosaic? Why not just call it normal or abnormal? So, yeah, exactly. So typically in a scenario when a mosaic result comes in a report, a lab, a genetic lab should have genetic counselors, right? So genetic counselors, what they do is they, um, they explain the risks associated with it. Uh, if it's a low mosaic, we don't report high mosaics because we think they are just abnormal. But if they are low mosaics, then there is a small, you have to look at if they are syndromic or not. So chromosome 13, 18, 21 have slightly high risk. Trisomies have much higher risk than monosomies. Trisomies account for 65% of uh, miscarriages, while monosomies is only 9%. So they take all that into context, and they also approach it from a perspective that it could be an artifact, right? So the patient now has the decision to whether they want to keep it, they want to transfer or not transfer, but it's all documented, and I think that's the approach that we have taken so far. Um, if you involve genetic counselors, then you're reducing the liability on the physician and on, on, on the clinic. 
Well, so, luckily, we have a genetic counselor here. We have a genetic counselor right <laughs> yeah, here. That's it. <laughs> Who can tell I'm us? Agree. How do I'm you agree. advise? I'm agree. Uh, I'm uh, in genetic counseling with patients. I am discuss the risk and the benefits to transfer or no uh, some uh, different the different kinds of mosaicism. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Nabil uh, says uh, 13, 18, 21 higher risk, but we have 14, 15 higher risk too, mm -hmm. 16 is the risk of a miscarriage and the other chromosomes, I look the the risks of the miscarriage, but the mosaicism is better than the trisomies. Mo mon monosomies is better than trisomies. Yes. But each case is uh, treated like a unique in this case. I, I have a lot of patients with uh, Low mosaicism, mm -hmm. who of uh, option the option of the couple is uh, continue to transfer, and I have I have six babies born <coughs> normally, absolutely normally. I see. Yeah. Uh, for example, Nabil, low mosaic and high mosaic are these like zero one or is this a gradient? What's this? Low mosaic and high mosaic. So the way I look at it, mm -hmm. uh, first let me put the statement, mosaicism does exist. Mm -hmm. I think it's below 0.5%. When you look at a, the, the, the way these algorithms are scoring uh, 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 trisomies and monosomies, it's just number of sequencing read. It's just counting, like Dr. Possum said, intermediate, ca account, uh, intermediate copy number. I would say intermediate... A, a count number because it's just counting. It's a count of sequencing read. So the counts in an algorithm is not, never going to be 100% because the samples are different. Some samples are better than others, right? So what you get is you get 100%, which is, let's say, 100,000 read correspond to two copy. 150,000 read correspond to three copy. So you may have 110. The algorithm is trying to adjust to that so they will score it slightly on a lower end. But if, it's, if it comes from a three copy, three, 150, and it scored it at 140, it's really a trisomy. That's what it is. It's a trisomy where the algorithms couldn't figure out how to score it. So the way I see it is if you get high mosaicism rates, high mosaic, mosaic is a trisomy. If you get a low mosaic, it could be normal, and there is a 0.5% chance that it could be an actual mosaic. Why they call it? Why they call it high mosaic? You know, why just oh. they don't say? Well, you know, each lab has different interpretation, right? It depends. I mean, just look at when when you look at studies transferring a, a, a mosaic uh, with 50% up, the implantation rates and pregnancy rates are very low, right? But they're still some of them still in plants, and I think that's what Jason probably was alluding to that there are. There are embryos that, uh, you know, may be stressed out and maybe there is a fragmentation, but really they could lead to a pregnancy. And there are those false positives and all these things that come with it. So why the lab called them uh, high mosaics and, and not abnormal? It's, it's really up to the lab. The lab defined their criteria based on their validation and stuff. I think the mistake we made, to, not as, as a company, but the industry is we took mosaicism and we just went with it, but reality is we didn't look at the pregnancy, we didn't look at the life birth, we didn't follow those cases. And how often do you see a mosaic life birth? We've seen two in the course of eight years. If we just use those, like, you know, a, a normal kind of... Uh, uh, way of looking at things, just look at an outcome, you will know what the story is. But, you know, again, it's up to the lab to define the, the, the criteria. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Santi, he is, is the expert in the field, so we should take his opinion. Yeah. <laughs> I leave it to the genetic counselor.
Well, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for the wonderful talk. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I have two questions. One's for Jason. So at CCRM, are you calling all mosaic embryos normal, or do you guys have a cutoff? So if it's like a low mosaic, it's a normal, and a high mosaic is abnormal? Uh, so good question. I, I'm not always privy to that information. Our genetics lab kind of keeps things close to the vest. Uh, for years, we didn't have mosaic. It was normal or abnormal based on Mandy's and the genetics lab's criteria. And it wasn't, quite frankly, readily available information. And, and I would ask, and I wouldn't be given that information. So they started a research trial where they now have a mosaic call. Uh, I don't know the cutoffs. That's, again, held close to the vest. So those physicians and clinics who all opt in, because they all have to opt in, so you don't have chaos for nurses and counselors and labs, you can have a normal call, an abnormal call, and a mo mosaic call. We treat mosaics as normals from the lab perspective in terms of how we hold them and store them. We don't discard them. So after all the euploids have been transferred and if there's mosaics, we still hold them. Our, our policies with aneuploids or abnormals are different. Patients can choose to discard them or ship them off site, but we treat mosaics as, as normal. So, so I, I don't know how our genetics lab differentiates. I would like to know, but, but I don't know. But the mosaics are being told, or the physicians are being told that the mosaics are normal. Well, they're, they're told that they're mosaics and they can be available for transfer. Uh, I don't know how the physicians are hearing this information or how they, they're conveying it to patients, but they're told that they're not abnormal, they're mosaic, whatever your definition is, they're not normal. They're somewhere in between, they are available for transfer, and Mandy and her genetic counselors counsel the patients accordingly that uh, they're not completely abnormal, they're mosaic. Our internal data says we get live births, that's not as high as the normals, so it's some sort of spectrum and they're somewhere in the middle. So. Thank you. And then the second question for Nabil, um, it seems like you strongly believe that a lot of the mosaicism is due to artifact. So why not call mosaics, when you biopsy and have the initial data, why not call it indeterminate and ask the lab to re-biopsy and verify? Well, that's what we tell the clinics. So when we, when we, call, when we report something as mo mosaic, which when we define mosaic is 20 to 40, which I have a problem with that too, because it's very hard to quantify the level of mosaicism mm -hmm. based on copy on, on read number. Um, it, it's not a perfect test to count, to exactly pinpoint the, the, the rate, the mosaicism uh, um, level. But what we tell the clinic, this is a call treated just like um, it could be, nor it could likely be normal, and then it's up to you and up to the patient to decide, do you want to re-biopsy? Because some patients don't want to re-biopsy, right? They'd rather transfer an embryo that has slightly higher risk without having to put the embryo into another stress, uh, rebiopsying, freezing, thawing. It's, it's a lot of, it's lot of uh, stress to the embryo. And patients are very nervous. This is a life birth coming, right? You don't want to manipulate that too much. So it's a really a decision of a patient, and then the, the, the physician comes there as a support system and genetic counselor as well. But the option, the, the notion that this is a mosaic is clearly saying that it could well be a normal embryo. That's what we say. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, do we have time? One more. OK, one more question. I just want to comment on uh, the mosaics. So like any other test that we do in medicine, you know, the gray zone is a gray zone. The lab is going to report out what they're seeing and based on criteria, and we need more regulations of all labs doing different things, but similarly. But what I'm trying to say is we cannot say if a lab reported a mosaic based on the current data that it's as good as a euploid. Like, I, I don't want anybody to leave here and go and transfer mosaics without proper consent. They are different embryos. The lab reported them in the gray zone. It's almost like cholesterol level. If you are 200, you have to be on statin. If you are 60, you are good to go. But if you're in that gray zone, you got to exercise. Like, 
<laughs> it's like it, these are mosaic embryos. These are reported differently. We have to counsel the patient. If you don't want mosaics reported, work with the lab that will give you only euploid and aneuploid. The lab has to be comfortable, and you have to be comfortable. Because whatever you are doing is going to be affecting the transfer and the birth. And we have pregnancies from mosaics right now, right? We have live births that look normal right now, but we don't know what these kids are going to do in 40 years from right now. So on all of our reporting and charting, it should be that the mosaic embryo was transferred, there was genetic counselor involved. We have a consent form that's available through SRM that should be signed, and it should be taken carefully. Like, we are the guardians of the clinical team is the guardian of the patient, and the lab has to report whatever they see based on the science of that time. The science might change later on, but we are the ones who are answerable to patients. The, the other things I would add is if you are getting 20% of your embryos with mosaic calls, then you have to look at that. that that's where, mm. you know, you shouldn't have more than 2 or 3%. That's like that's. I mean, average that we see in very, very large number of embryos. So if you're seeing 20%, then you, mu you must look at your system, the labs, the embryologies, everything. You have to look at that to try to address it. If you have a small percentage, 2%, 3%, then look at that as a gray zone, like, like, like she was saying. So 2%, it's like one in a, two, in a, uh, two in a hundred. It's not that bad, right? You, you can still have options for transfers, Etc. And then those patients that only have that mosaic, the only option, that's where genetic counseling comes in and, and, and all that. So I think the analogy to the cholesterol level is a very good one. I, I can't un imagine a physician would want to send off a blood test on their patient and you get a red dot or you get a green dot. Green dot's good. Red dot, you put them on, an, on a statin. I don't want that. I want to see what the number is. I want to hear what the lab has to say, and then the physician has to eventually exercise some sort of judgment. That's called clinical judgment. It's called clinical judgment, and I don't understand why our field is continuing to dumb itself down, get dumber and dumber and dumber. We just want black and white. We just want to tell me, transfer this one, don't transfer that one. I don't want to think about it. Why wouldn't I want to think about it? Why wouldn't I want to know that that is an intermediate result? And sometimes you'll get one of those. And then you have to decide whether you repeat it or you don't repeat it or whether you feel what the situation is. Does the patient have 10 other embryos? Does the patient have zero other embryos? Did it take you three retrievals to get to here today? That is a clinical judgment that I think our field has to do. And, uh, and constantly dumbing it down and, and putting all the pressure on the, on the lab to say, no, I want you to tell me this one and then that one. So Wait, that's but was it, wasn't that the, the original thought of the test is either the right number of chromosomes are there or they're not, so it would be red or green, and now we're, there is this gray area, so maybe that's part of the next evolution is it is going to be a reference range more or less, and you absolutely have your selection tiers. Hey, if they're normal, they go back first, and then you've got this gradient, and you select them based on this, this sliding scale. Um, well, no lab test is perfect. This is when AMH came out, people were just going nuts about AMH, and, and that it never changes, that you can get it any time, and it is going to be with you for the rest of your life. And now you get a value in January and get a value in February from another lab that is twice as high. We see that all the time. We're able to exercise judgment for some reason when we measure cholesterol and AMH and FSH levels, and for some reason when we get the stuff out of the genetics laboratory, we're so intimidated and so afraid that we don't want to challenge it. We take it as it is and don't transfer the high mosaics or don't transfer anything that people say is abnormal. That is an abnormal test. That's not necessarily 100% accurate in all cases. Hmm. Very good point. I think, uh, I think it is time. It's been a great discussion. Uh, we could probably go on forever, but uh, uh, it's a time for coffee. I'd like to, yes. I'd like to thank our uh, speakers and my co-moderator for, for uh, their wonderful talks. And, um, and uh, we will meet again at what time? What's the, when does the next session start?
15 minutes break. Very good. So we'll meet at 1035. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back from break. Good morning. I uh, hope you're enjoying yourself so far. With our last segment, Addressing PGT, we move on to the final phase of this symposium. Last but certainly not least, the segment is titled Genetics and IVF. My name is Maddie Glorioso, and I'll be moderating segment five along with Dr. Monet. Genetics finds itself in the center of IVF with correlas correlations with each respective department to include endocrinology, research, PGT, and embryology and andrology. With the comprehensive nature of genetics, we bring to you two profound speakers that demonstrate the impact of genetics in IVF. Our first speaker in this segment is Dr. Cristina Carvalho. So Dr. Carvalho is the Director of Genetic Counseling, Education, and Scientific Advice with Progenesis Brazil. Dr. Carvalho graduated in biology and biomedicine from Paulista State University, Julio de Mesquita Filo in Sao Paulo, Brazil. She earned her master's degree in human and medical genetics from Federal University of Sao Paulo and went on to pursue her doctorate and postdoctorate in medicine, gynecology uh, concentration area from Federal University of Sao Paulo. She was a researcher and professor at the university for 18 years with extensive experience in genetic counseling and the development of scientific research in the women's health segment. And so today, Dr. Cavallio will be discussing a Brazilian perspective of genetic counseling and assisted reproduction, an overview of Brazil. And as a genetic counselor myself, I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. Cavallio. Hi, good morning. I'm come back. <laughs> I'm waiting for presentation. Present oh, great. Well, uh, I continue uh, and finish this, uh, the genes, this great symposium. I need to uh, my uh, to uh, set for. Nabil and Sheila, thank you so much for this opportunity. Well, I talk about uh, a point of view of genetic counseling in assisted reproduction uh, from Brazil, okay, for Brazil. Uh, we have a different ways to conduce the genetic counseling in different countries, okay? And then, my agenda, uh, I put the a little definition and general vision of genetic counseling, uh, a genetic counseling training and act in Brazil, and in assisted reproduction and focus in assisted reproduction, and ex example of clinical uh, cases and final messages. Well, what is it genetic counseling? Okay, I do. Uh, a genetic counseling, really? I, I do a counseling for a couple, for a patient? No, this, terms, this term uh, have a different, uh, a different definition. It's a communication process, a large communication process né, that deals with uh, issues associated with the occurrence or risk of occurrence of a genetic disease in a family, in a couple, in a patient. And we conduce to, uh, you conduce the genetic counseling before undergoing a genetic test, testing or start a treat, uh, starting a treatment in an understanding the results obtained from the tests conducted, exploring available options and determine the next steps or give an options for the next, next steps for the patients. Well, when I talk with the patients, I needed to, I need to know uh, information, a lot of information. The precious information is a family information. And then, I need to conduct a comprehensive anamnesis of the couple or patient, guaranteeing the maximal 
information about the case for assisted uh, in the characterization of a disease, disease and its a genetic inheritance to provide a guidance on the most appropriate genetic tests. The family, when the family is most, uh, infor when I have a most information, I came, I, I do the, oh, sorry, <laughs> I can do the, the, pedig the pedigree of the family and I have a lot of information to have to take a precision way, okay? Without the informations, we need more tests or more uh, ways to find the way, the, the certain way. And then, uh, when I talk about genetics, I told for everybody, we need to remember that when I look the beautiful faces, when I look the guy or the girl uh, and says, oh, so great for a uh, date or something, we need to know we can't see the chromosomes or the DNA. That's important because now here, all of here, it's great, perfect. But what I, what I carry in my DNA, that's the point. And then we have a different ways of investigation, different way of investigation. It's possible. Investigate, and I initially, the investigation and the conversation with the couple, uh, looking for the basis of genetics. That's a karyotyping. The evolution, uh, the, when I need evaluation of chromosomes as a base of information, we needed a good quality karyotype, good quality, because a bad quality, it's terrible for, gave me a way for this couple. And then, what genetic tests would the most indicated when we seek to evaluate genes? We have a lot of tests now, no? In the past, no, but now we have a lot of. What is, what is the best test? I don't have a best test. I have options, and the option depends on the history present, presented by the couple. Uh, we have many possibilities now, okay? And then, what are objectives in the genetic counseling? A, then, a characterizing uh, uh, through a good anamnese of the couple and family, collecting the maximum information about this case, enable to better family planning in future generations, explain why not everything congenital is hereditary. It's a big mistake for the patients, for the physicians, for the Every, everybody in the health area. And, and in the final, empowered the couple or patient to make an informed decision because I gave to patients ways. The decision is for the patient, is the couple. Depends on that. Well, who it indicated for a genetic counseling? It's possible to do a genetic counseling in all of time of the life, in different line of time. Uh, we here now in, uh, stay in the genet oh, 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 in genetic, in genetic pre-implantation genetic tests. Okay, but it's possible now the, uh, the genetic counseling for a prenatal genetic testing, a, new a newborn, with some, uh, some uh, features and 
in the adulthood because we know we have uh, genetic conditions, the later, later uh, appearance, and then it's possible to a genetic counseling. And who it's indicated in, in this, uh, in a, for a genetic counseling, uh, when I think about a couple or a, a patient who gives uh, uh, for assisted reproduction. Couples with children who have a condition that's not well understood. It's possible to do a genetic counseling for another, uh, for a planning another, uh, another baby. Individuals with a family history of cancer is so indicated. Women who have had previous pregnancy with uh, spontaneous abortions or stillbirths. Individuals belonging to ethnic groups uh, 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 at risk, such as Mediterranean population. We know the people, uh, the, the ethnic groups have some conditions to higher risk, the, uh, the genetic conditions. Couples with consanguineous relationship, in, here in Brazil we have a lot of couples with, genetic, with a consanguineous relationships. And then, and individuals who have been exposed to mutagenic agents, uh, such as radiation or chemicals too. And uh, in genetic counseling training in Brazil, it's so different from USA. Here, the genetic counseling is a professional, uh, really uh, considered, knows, uh, but in Brazil, we started uh, in a few years, in a few years. We have uh, one, only one curse, the first and the most recognized curse in Brazil. It's offered for a un one, uh, one university. USP, University of Sao Paulo. This curse is a good curse and prepared professional to provide the genetic information to patients and another healthcare professionals, participate in multidisciplinary groups involved in the study of patients and families with genetic diseases and acting in a public or private, private uh, hospitals, laboratories, specialized clinics, uh, but only one curse in a whole country, it's so difficult. <laughs> well, who can perform a genetic counseling? In Brazil, I said, it's difficult because we started in a few years, but we need that the people, the population know in Brazil, it's necessary a specific specialization in genetics focus, in genetic counseling. It's not someone to do a master degree in genetic, it's possible to do a genetic counseling, okay? But it's possible for a different professionals, biochemical scientists, biologists, or other health prof healthcare professionals and the physicians. For the physicians, we have a distinguished uh, university. Okay, a career. And for the other healthcare professionals, who can perform, what, what can I do uh, with the patients? Uh, I can explain the risk estimate, estimation of a genetic disease occurrence, indicate the benefits, limits, or existing in a genetic test uh, to presenting a genetic test results in a clear and accessible manner, because the problem here is understood the results of a genetic test. It's difficult for the patients, it's difficult for the physicians, and this is a good way to do. Uh, to highlight the possibility scenarios to result that a genetic test can present uh, and suggest which genetic test may be an option or the best option for the patient's case. 
Okay? And the difference for the physicians. Physicians act, conduct really a medical consultation with phys physical examination of the affected patient, prescribe the tests or the tests to clarify the genetic condition and prescribe treatments when possible and indicate, indicate for each case. Well, what should be considered in genetic counseling when the focus is assisted reproduction really? Well, identify whether uh, we are dealing with a chromosome or a genetic alteration. I need to know if I have uh, something for looking a chromosome or a genes or genes to determine the best strategy to flow. Karyotype is the baseline genetic test for any couple seeking assisted reproduction. And I said for all of in Brazil, uh, some physicians ask me a lot of, what, what do you think about karyotype? You think uh, it's necessary for all couples to seek in a, uh, assisted reproduction? And I answer, yes. I think the karyotype is necessary when we born, <laughs> born in maternity and do and perform a karyotype. This shorter a time for a long period to know uh, if you, pos you have a translocation, a balanced translocation, a inversion, something to uh, create a problem in the following to, uh, to pregnancy. Well, and chromosomal alterations require different evaluations strategy. That's very important. It's only as, oh, okay, I have a, oh, Christina, I have a patient with a balanced translocation. Can I perform a PGTA? Okay, no. <laughs> no, I need to know the segments, uh, the range of the segments to explain. The best option for this patient is PGTSR, no PGTM, PGTA. Oh, I can perform, uh, I can perform, um, uh, anemia, uh, I can perform X fragile in PGTA. Oh my God, no. <laughs> the way here, it's other. It's a PGTM, please. And this is the great questions I have in Brazil about the genetic conditions uh, from the physicians. It's needed to know uh, we have different strategies for a different uh, uh, alterations in genetics. Well, uh, then, for monogenic inheritance, it's important, it's very important to know the gene, the variant, and for determining the type of inheritance. Because, okay, I have, I, I have a cousin with a genetic disease. Can I uh, perform a PGTM for me? No. I don't know if you carry something. It's needed to know this. You need to perform a genetic, a genetic investigation, a, a gene investigation first to uh, perform it or no. It's needed to know for it's indicated or not for this case. And then we need this way. Uh, to provide appropriate guidance for embryo evaluation. And uh, in genetic counseling for patients in assisted reproduction, uh, we can uh, we can make a different ways, really, uh, to provide a genetic risk assessment. We can provide a risk, really, for a patient in in the most of part, I can. But in some cases, it, this is a challenge. Uh, for example, in uh, autistic, in cases of autistics, the patients, the, the couples want to know what the risk 
for another baby with the same condition. It's difficult to measure this risk. And we need to look case, uh, each case in particular. Some cases is possible to measure the risk. Another case, it's impossible. In a pretest, when a couple looking for a genetic counseling for uh, uh, know if it carries some uh, variation, some genetic variation, it's possible too in this case. And a post test and a possible results, okay, to indicate it uh, to patient what hap what's happening with this result, what the way to following with this result. We have uh, two ways, three ways with this result. That's another point. An implication and the limitations of the tests, because uh, many persons don't know what is the, that the genetic uh, tests have a limitation. For example, PGTA. We discuss about the PGTA now. PGTA is a diagnostic test. No, it's a screening test. Okay, and then we need to know the limitations because we can I can provide to a uh, hundred percent to results. I have a limitation. It's very important to know the benefits and limitations always. Okay. To uh, to patient take I inform a decision make because the patient needs know to have your way, okay? And the future following, follow the cases, the, this case. Okay, goes to clinical case to find <laughs> to. I separate three cases. The first case is a couple referred due to a history of four pregnancy loss. First, a ectopic loss, the, the, the woman lost the one fallopian tube. Second, a positive beta test followed the negative result, uh, com configure uh, uh, I forgot the name. <laughs> biochemical pregnancy, a biochemical pregnancy. Third and fourth pregnancy reached a seven weeks with evidence a heartbeat, but a sequence lost. Well, I asked for, for a couple, the first question, the karyotype, and we perform a karyotype, and the results, bingo. <laughs> the results is uh, the husband had a balanced translocation. This is linked with this result. Confirm, no? What the recommend approach for this case? Explain to, uh, I need to explain the couple that the balanced translocation carries a high risk to further miscarriage and possibility of a pregnancy continue with a, the birth of a baby with a chromosomal alterations with malformations, okay? And what I suggest, IVF, uh, a gen IVF uh, and a genetic evaluation of embryos for, uh, through the PGT-SR. That's the indicate. I calculate the regions and I'm secured to PGT PGT-SR. It's possible to perform. For preventing a further miscarriage and reduce a risk of a baby being, being born with a chromosome normality, okay? And case two, the couple refer uh, being a part of Jewish community, both, pa both uh, part of being Ashkenazi Jews. Did, okay, my first question, did perform? Yes, but look the results of the couple. The wife have a balanced balance translocation. In this case, Okay, the couple, 
gave to me for this result. But when the couple said that's a Jewish community, it's a part of the Jewish community, in my mind, I need to know if uh, this couple have uh, something in the genes, because it's possible. What I can do, since this Jewish had uh, usually a common genetic background, I suggest perform a genetic compatibility test for couples. It's a carry screening couple, for a couple. And look the result, obvious, no? The couple have the same point of mutation for exogen, the same point. Well, what I do with this? I need to propose a strategy for this couple and options. It's possible options. Yeah, it's possible two options for this couple. First option, embryo evaluation for, uh, by a combined PGTM and PGTSR or use donate eggs to eliminate the two points, the risk of translocation, unbalanced, and a genetic condition, okay? What do you think, uh, what, uh, what do you think about uh, the, the, the couple choice? The first or second? First. Of course, <laughs> first. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Case three, couple seeking a family planning. Only a family planning. Uh, a young wife, third two, uh, without prior gynecology abnormalities, uh, husband, 40 years, without sperm abnormalities, okay? And the karyotype, yes, in both normal. And then I'm asking a long, a long conversation with the couple to know if you have some history of a genetic disease in the family or any consanguinity relationship. No, no, history for uh, genetic disease or consanguinity. Okay, we have a lower risk in this case, but the husband is a physician and he's afraid, completely afraid with a genetic disease. Okay. Uh, what they recommend for the approach? Of course, a genetic compatibility, a carry screening test for the couple. And I think, oh, that's okay. It's everything uh, being normal. But I'm so surprised with the result. The beautiful woman and the young woman carrier a deletion in DMD gene for Duquesne and Becker muscular dystrophy. And then the options for the couple. First, obvious, embryo evaluation by PGTM or use a donated egg to eliminate the genetic conditions. And this case, the couple op option for first or second? Of course, first, always. Always. <laughs> well, the final messages. It's important to know the couple's history through a detailed anamnesis. It's very important. The indication of the appropriate genetic tests is directly depends on the couple history. And the interpretation of the results determine the guidance for the available options, and assisting the couple in understand the aspects involved, conducing diagnosis, the likely curse of the disease, and available manage, management. We currently li live in the area of many possibilities in genetics, and we need to remain vigilant because it's so fast now, the changes is so fast. We gain 
a new, uh, new test, new mutations every day. And when, when we think that I found the answer for all questions, God changed the password. Thank you so much. Well, and now we come to the, the last speaker. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Millie Thakur. Uh, she's a triple board certified physician specializing in reproductive endocrinology and, and infertility, uh, medical genetics, and obstetric and gynecology. Uh, she completed her residency training in obstetric and gynecology in India and later in the US, where she completed a combined fellowship in reproductive endocrinology and infertility and medical genetics from Wayne State uh, University in Detroit. Uh, she's also the founder and, and CEO of Genome Ally, a company focused on making genetic accessibility and affordable to everyone. And she's also work, uh, she also works at the Fertility Center as an attendee physician. Dr. Thakur uh, has published uh, numerous articles in peer-reviewed journals and presented her work at national conferences receiving the Pfizer SRI President Award. She serves as a clinical assistant professor in a prominent medical school at, and has served at, on the ECO Clinical Consensus Gynecology Committee. Uh, Dr. Takur provides compassionate and individualized care to her patients, uh, developing treatments uh, tailored to their unique needs. Uh, she's going to talk about um, polygenic variables and environmental effects on IVF treatment and outcome. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I wanted to express my gratitude to Nabil and Sheila for having me as a speaker and to the organizing committee uh, for organizing the conference. Uh, this is my first time in a, in a conference of this size. Usually I'm at ASRM and like running between rooms. <laughs> uh, I also wanted to uh, thank the speakers because uh, it's an honor uh, to be with all the attendees and speakers and get to know you. Um, I'm going to talk about um, polygenic variables and environmental effects on um, um, IVF treatment and outcomes. Because I am the last speaker at the end of this, my talk, I will give you two books that everybody should read that focus on genetics and our own health. So that's a, a, a big plus to listen to me <laughs> and staying. Um, I don't have any disclosures except for I'm a um, persistent optimist. So you have to take it with a grain of salt. I'm very optimistic about most things. So if, if you like a more um, rough approach to life, my talk might not sound good to you. Um, the objectives of the talk are um, the, uh, to discuss the uh, polygenic diseases and environmental factors that may affect IVF outcomes and how uh, these factors vary between individuals. Uh, discuss the importance of monitoring and adjusting these variables to optimize IVF success both in the preparation for any sort of fertility treatment during the stimulation if they are doing IVF and also in the lab. Um, to highlight the role of personalized medicine in IVF treatment, and at the end of this talk, I want to convince you to consider uh, the patient's unique genetic and environmental factors, reproductive history, and um, lifestyle choices in developing personalized IVF treatment plan. And uh, with your help, we can do it at scale, uh, take a lot of patients with individualized plans through. Um, so what is a polygenic variable? Um, a polygenic variable um, or trait is a characteristic that is in influenced by two or more genes. Uh, these traits do not follow the patterns of Mendelian inheritance because multiple genes are involved. And uh, they, are, they are determined, these conditions are determined by the joint contribution of a number of independently acting or interacting polymorphic genes and environmental effects. 
these traits are complicated. They're not like uh, recessive conditions or dominant conditions or X-linked conditions that manifest. They manifest when the right environmental conditions are present, but there is a genetic predisposition. All of us sitting in this room have a predisposition to a polygenic variant, and it depends on what you're doing for your health that it may or may not manifest in your lifetime. So some of the common polygenic conditions in reproductive health um, uh, include endometriosis, polycystic ovarian disease, ovarian um, reserve uh, variability. Male factor is a very important polygenic condition, which I'm not gonna talk today. And uh, the last one is unexplained infertility. We call it unexplained infertility, but really it's a polygenic condition that we just don't know much about of which genes are interacting. So let's start with endometriosis. Um, each one of us knows that it affects 10% uh, of all women, 25 to 40% of um, infertile women. Um, it's, it manifests in many patients, others just have it hidden. Um, it can range from superficial peritoneal lesions, ovarian endometriomas, or deep infiltrating endometriosis. Um, and ASRM classifies it into four stages with like increasing severity from stage one to four. It's one of those complicated conditions that we clinicians in REI just don't like. It's polygenic, it, it causes a lot of problems. Um, what are those adverse effects? Um, there's a lot of um, uh, information on adverse effects of endometriosis and IVF. It has a definite negative effect on ovarian reserve. Um, a lot of it has to do with immunological function, but also by the space occupying lesions of endometriomas that cause the decreased reserve. There's lower number of oocytes and decreased fertilization rates. Uh, poor egg quality is a very big factor. Um, fewer number of embryos created, fewer number of top quality embryos created. Uh, there's controversy. I was looking up papers, and there's all sorts of papers about whether uh, the aneuploidy rate stays the same, which it does in some of the studies. And in other studies where there was an endometrioma uh, present, there was um, uh, lowering of the euploidy rate. So it may be contributing to bad embryo quality, leading to higher aneuploidy. And then in uh, essence, it leads to a lower pregnancy rate. So the genetics of endometriosis is polygenic. It's multifactorial. It gets affected by environmental factors. There is a definite familial clustering of endometriosis, and it's been associated, and there's been a lot of research done in this area with like gene polymorphisms. But it's not just the genetic variability. So the, if you were to like um, understand all the information that I'll be sharing, there is the genetic code that we are born with, which is like how the different nucleotides are there, but on top of that, there is transcription changes that are happening, which is happening real time during a person's lifetime, and different actions change that every day in our life. Um, and then also there is epigenetic changes, which is also environmental, which is also a continuous fashion. So there are gene polymorphisms that some women are born with, and there is also reported cases of male endometriosis in lungs. So there's some polymorphisms that can pre predispose people to gene uh, and having endometriosis. But on top of that, there's altered microRNA expression in the tissue. And then there is also epigenetic modifications that are present. So this is a study from Hansen et al. in 2010, which shows the differential gene expression between the utopic, which is the endometrium inside the uterus, and the ectopic endometrium in the endometriosis lesions. And you can see the different genes that are uh, transcribed differently. And they are from different areas of uh, action in the body. So the cytoskeleton genes, signal transduction genes, cell cycle genes, immunology genes. And that's why this condition is so complicated to take care of because there's all sorts of genetic changes that are happening and um, it's important to know and understand this better. So there's been a lot of like um, genome-wide association studies, we call them GWAS, uh, Dr. Fayuzi talked to about them yesterday. So these, uh, this is a summary um, of a meta-analysis by Sapkota et al. 
um, who did a meta-analysis of 11 genome-wide association case control studies. This subset was really big with 17,000 endometriosis cases and 191,000 control cases. And they came up with like 19 independent single nucleotide polymorphisms that were different between individuals with endometriosis and with, um, you know, the controls. So what this, what is this polygenic risk score? I know we are slowly coming to terms with the polygenic risk score for the embryos. I, I know everybody has an opinion about it and it's like a big topic, but polygenic risk scores are not new. They've been there, they've been done for a lot of um, different conditions in medicine. So they are emerging tools to predict clinical phenotypes and outcomes of individuals. Basically, risk alleles from distinct phenotypes are weighed by their effect size. And then they are, uh, estimates are made and then they are summed up. And then you come out with the number and based on the polygenic risk score, there is prediction of having that person having a condition. Because there is not a single gene involved, you have to put a lot of information in to find out if this person would be predisposed to having um, a phenotype that is polygenic. And that's why this topic is so complicated. So what can we do? So action items, I think this is uh, important information that if you have somebody where you suspect endometriosis, diagnose it is one of the things and then act on it. And um, in my mind, because of how medicine uh, specialists work, we work in our silos. So if I'm a, con uh, if I'm a clinician, I want to just do clinician stuff and I don't have too much information about what's happening in the lab. And then the same thing is if there is a genetic information, genetic counselor would take care of it. And as a researcher, if I work on egg quality, which I did for my thesis in REI um, uh, fellowship, I just worked on egg quality. My co-fellow was doing something on embryos and I had nothing to do with her work. So what I'm trying to say in these polygenic conditions, you have to be very mindful from the very beginning when you get to interact with the patient to start working on correcting the problem because it's such a complicated thing. So because there is increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines, an anti-inflammatory diet and lifestyle is very important. And there's a lot of literature out there about how every day the gut microbiome changes how we interact with different conditions. So it's very important to, uh, for us to read about and know the pre and probiotics that you will be prescribing to these patients. It makes a huge difference if you have the inflammation low at the time of the patient trying to conceive. Uh, vitamin D has a big role, and there is a lot of studies that show that because of how ubiquitously the vitamin D binds in our genome, it binds to about over 2,000 sites in the genome by a nuclear receptor, so it's very important for us to look at that information. And then other anti-inflammatory things like omega-3. Now we, we heard yesterday about oocyte mitochondrial dysfunction, and it's a true thing. If you don't believe in mitochondria, you need to rethink about your medical information. It's like one of the key things, and it's very important to have some sort of an energy molecule being given to the patient. So CoQ10 is one of the proven benefit um, techniques. You should be giving that to the patient. If there is endometriosis, we should be suppressing endometriosis with a GnRH agonist, antagonist, or progestins. Even though there is this tendency of like, once the eggs are out of that um, environment from the ovary, the outcomes are going to be okay, but it might make a difference of one or two eggs per patient in that cohort. So if you were gonna get, say, three euploid eggs, if you did suppress endometriosis, there's going to be a slight change and it could make a big change and then you might not have to transfer that mosaic embryo. So the last, which I don't use in my practice, is low-dose naltrexone. There is some information, some physicians are using it for immunomodulation. Um, I think immunology is one of those um, frontier areas now that kind of interact with genetics and we have to be up to speed with it. I don't use naltrexone just because I didn't train with it, but there is some data out there. Now, the second condition I want to talk about is PCOS. We all know about it. 
Um, it has a worldwide prevalence of five to 10%, very easy to diagnose. Most, most of the time we struggle with diagnosing uh, mild endometriosis, but most of us will diagnose PCOS. It's not hard to diagnose, it manifests pretty early. Um, there's infertility, oligomenorrhea, uh, amenorrhea, hirsutism, insulin resistance, obesity, hyperandrogenism, polycystic ovaries, yet there are lean PCOS patients. So be mindful of keeping an open mind. We all want to go through the modified Rotterdam criteria, but it may not always fit the criteria, and that's why uh, we need to be using our clinical judgment. And then it's uh, associated with metabolic dysfunction. And um, there is a lot of uh, research, again, out there about the adverse impact of PCOS and IVF success. They have increased number of eggs. Uh, you know, whenever we are doing retrieval in the uh, office and it's like 50, 60 eggs are coming out, that's most of the time an association with PCOS. There's some data about impaired oocyte com competence some data about like low site fertilization, altered early embryo development, decreased blastulation, compromised development competence of embryos, increased miscarriage rate, which is mostly um, because of the metabolic problems and hyperinsulinemia and all that. Um, there was some studies that said that overall percentage of euploid embryos was similar, and that could be because they start out with a lot of eggs. So they would have comparable euploid embryos. Um, but then there were another paper, which was like an oral abstract at ASRM in 2020, where they said 9.6% higher aneuploidy rate. And today, after listening to uh, Dr. Swain's topic about stress, you know, if, if it's happening out in the lab and that can affect it, a, a, a PCOS patient is under a lot of metabolic stress. So I'm not surprised if, if it causes some sort of aneuploidy in the eggs, uh, which then gets transferred into uh, embryo aneuploidy. Um, there is a study from um, Hardy et al. in 1995 that said that there is a subset of women with PCOS undergoing IVF that have normal embryo development and pregnancy outcomes. So most of us get away with a good outcome for PCOS patients just because they show young, um, and we have embryos to work with, we would get a euploid embryo, and most of us use um, a good clinical judgment in their care. Again, it's a complicated polygenic condition, so if you look at all the genes that can be involved, um, there, um, the orange corner is genes involved in ovarian and, and adrenal steroidogenesis. There's genes involved in steroid hormone effects. There's genes involved in gonadotropin action and regulation genes involved in insulin action and secretion. There's other genes, you know, that are involved. And then epigenetics of PCOS is a whole another thing. A lot of researchers, in, including Dr. Richard Legro, has spent their entire career just looking at the genetics and polygenic risk scores for uh, PCOS and have not come down to a single actionable gene and that's because it is polygenic. All of these conditions, now you don't know when you have a patient with PCOS, which one of these are going to be up and down regulated. And because it's not a static system, it changes by the interventions that we do. So that brings me to the next slide where these are the interventions. We've always done them. Uh, but I want to just emphasize that it's important for us to get good quality eggs to the lab as a clinician. Like you can't have them work magic and make embryos that are euploid unless we work hard for months before you do the IVF to get a good quality condition inside of the patient who's going to stim. So weight management. I know every, every place has a different cutoff, and it's very important uh, to, for us as providers to learn how, how to reduce weight and what, how to motivate the patient. It's complicated. Um, diet. Very important, anti-inflammatory, low-carb diet is very, very important because there is a daily interaction again with the gut and then, um, there is a lot of uh, role of what we eat in what comes out. So again, I'm stressing it again because we, when I trained, the microbiome was not there. As a medical student, it was not even talked about. It came afterwards, so many of us have not been able to come up to speed with what what is going on. 
Okay, so exercise, again, very important. We talked about vitamin D, omega-3, and CoQ10. We have to address insulin resistance, and there's a lot of role of metformin. We are, in our practice, using very comfortably myo-inositol, so you know, that's important to use. And then you have to be mindful of development of OHSS, so careful gonadotropin dosing. Uh, Dr. Um, Fayuzi yesterday mentioned about this FSHR receptor polymorphism, and that's why you, know, you have to be careful with dosing patients. Um, and then uh, antagonist, which we are all using uh, most of the time. Uh, GNRH agonist trigger, elective freeze-all, and then um, there is a role of VEGFR receptor in OHSS. So cabergoline helps. I, uh, when I was flying in uh, from uh, Grand Rapids a few days ago, uh, one of the doctors called me and said there was a patient who had OHSS at another practice and now she's developed preeclampsia at 16 weeks. So the VEGF receptor polymorphism might be at play in her and you know, for the next pregnancy, we're gonna have to make a different kind of plan. Um, so, Again, coming back to, uh, we, we can't say the lab is gonna solve the problem or AI or automation or anything. We, we have to start working with our patients, which we always do, but sometimes during a very busy session, you know, it kind of is not that high on the radar and patient has about 100 things to do before they can go through egg retrieval. So like, always be mindful that there is a resource person in your team, it may not be you but somebody who's just making sure that the patient's maintaining a good weight and you know, taking all the supplements and eating healthy. Um, and then we talked about ovarian response yesterday. Um, different studies have said that there is like 15 to 18 is a good number of eggs if you wanted to have uh, a good embryo for transfer now and then you know, for a second pregnancy. However, there is variability. We have all been in a situation where the AMH was like one or 1 1.2 and then we started the stim and she's on maximum stim and nothing's happening. And um, that's because there is a whole genetics of ovarian response that is being studied. Um, there is um, uh, this, I, I like this study because they genotype 125 egg don 124 egg donors and followed a standard protocol and they found polymorphism and it was directly correlated with how many eggs were retrieved. So it's important for us at some point, there is no clinical test available now, but hopefully in the future, we've, we should be able to give patient that a test and like figure out, okay, this is a high responder or a low responder and go from there. Again, important strategies. Always for your low responders, if you're worried about a low response, priming is important. Um, I don't use androgen priming, again, just because we didn't train on it and there is a risk of side effects from testosterone priming, but it's being offered to patient, uh, growth hormone, and that's the individualized care. Like if you did a little bit more upfront with counseling of the patient and putting some special plans, alerting them that we might have less eggs, they will be more uh, retained in your practice. Like you would be able to probably do two or three rounds rather than just going through and then, oh, we didn't find eggs and then they're gonna have an emotional meltdown. So what we do in our practice is we um, uh, work on these areas. So decreased follicular recruitment, you need priming. Uh, issues with fo uh, follicular development and oocyte quality, we are big on reg supplementation. All of our patients, you know, um, are on supplements. Um, I'll give you the logic of the last three that are there. So they are like not so widely used in medicine, uh, in reproductive medicine, NMN supplementation, but it, there is a lot of uh, literature in um, um, ovarian, uh, in, in retina and heart and other aging models. Um, and then variability in ovarian response. So we talked about um, the uh, pharmacogenomics yesterday and I think it's on the horizon. We are going to get there as soon as a, a researcher with some funding is able to just commit to the project. I think it's an open area. There's a lot of like um, opportunity there. It's just like we are so busy in optimizing our IVF stuff that we haven't gone into that area yet. 
Um, so uh, this is my last slide, and I want to like um, uh, say that it is my desire that we can come up with like a personalized, easy approach for a patient. Um, always when you are looking at your patients, if you work in different countries, look at your ethnic backgrounds. Like patients in different countries don't believe, don't um, behave the same way, and that could be a difference in like what they're eating and what their BMI is and other things, so ethnicity. And if you work in a diverse population, you can actually yourself in your mind make a plan. If this patient is coming from Southeast Asia, she could be a lean PCO. This is what I'm gonna do and this is going to be my plan. And if, if this patient is a certain background, what, am, what is my plan? So it's, it's, that is the individualized approach, that is the clinical judgment that we should be still using um, to optimize everything. Age, for sure, we already use, right? BMI, um, your trigger dosing sometimes has to be changed because of the BMI, and that's very important. Uh, stress levels, very important. Like, um, we sometimes minimize that, and we just say, okay, we'll get the eggs, and we'll do ICSI, and we'll find a euploid embryo, but I, I believe that each individual is a, a, a is a machine. There's like, if you put the machine under a lot of stress, it's not gonna work good. Uh, male factor, like, if you're just focusing on the woman, it's not gonna work. And a male factor is a whole beast in itself, so. Um, ultimately, we have to have an individual ovarian simulation, an individualized embryology lab approach, and then, you know, your embryologist um, for clinicians, and I'm addressing the clinicians in the room, your embryologist should be at full, full um, collaboration with you to say they can co-culture if they have certain characteristics. Because sometimes I don't know, but they know. They will say, okay, let's just transfer on day two. I'm not gonna be able to make blast ever. And if that is your decision with the patient, that is the individualization that we have to do. Um, because this is my last slide and because you all stayed, <laughs> I want to give you the special that I have to offer. So I want you to remind you that each one of us, inside of us, has a lot of memory. And you, when we are treating patients, we should remember that. All of us have atomic memory inside of us. Every atom inside of our body remembers what it has to do, and there is this atomic memory. On top of that, there is elemental memory. So we have nitrogen in our body and oxygen, and it remembers what has to be done. There is an evolutionary memory. All of us went through that little blastocyst stage, and then we went through the whole, all of it. And then there is genetic memory. Our genes, no matter what we think and do, and it will still work, and it still transcribes. We have all the functions that are going through. And then on top of that, it is our personal memories. So when I say personalized approach to IVF, we can only be as good to our patients if we are good to ourselves. Like if you are hungry, and if I am hungry, <laughs> and you want me to do a procedure, there will be about a 5%. I will still be able to do it with very safe um, mechanism, but there will be a slight difference, and mostly we get away with it. But if you accumulate it over a lifetime, if you do egg retrievals, and you have your uh, one arm in a certain way for like 20, 30 years, your shoulder's gonna start to hurt. So it's remembering, we have this memory. So like, what I want to say is, please take care of yourself. The personalized approach includes you in there. And I wanted to give two books, uh, name of two books. If you guys have phones, you can put it in there right away. Um, most of you might have already heard them because they are very important books. So one of them is Lifespan, Lifespan, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To. It's a book about aging. Each one of us is aging every day. So, you know, it's important. It's by David Sinclair. How many have already heard of the book? Wonderful, so there are some people, it's like, it's an important book. Lifespan, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To by David Sinclair. And the second one is Super Genes by Deepak Chopra. And what it actually explains to us is that our genes are changing every day. Even we, we were born with the blueprint, it's changing. If you had water instead of coffee this morning, by this evening, the transcription is gonna be slightly different for you. So 
that's the thought I want to leave you with. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you to our speakers for that wonderful discussion. At this time, I'd like to invite the audience to ask any questions. Do we have anyone at this time? Jewish couple with a translocation where you hit the jackpot, uh, you should buy a lottery ticket. Um, <laughs> did, they, did they get a normal embryo? Yeah. You have, we have, uh, the couple have only, only one embryo, but this embryo is carrying the disease, is uh, with the disease. The 30 year old woman only got one blastocyst? On, uh, she has only three or four, blast, uh, three or four uh, follicles, and blastocyst only one. Yes, you didn't mention that she had low, uh, low yeah, reserve. Yeah, low she, she, because, because the translocation. Because the translocation is better quality of the, or the follicles. Better quality. Thank you. Okay. Hi, thank you for the wonderful talks. I feel like genetics is definitely the heart of um, IVF. Uh, we've learned so much more about genetics in the recent years and how involved genetics is. The pharmacogenetics is wonderful also. I have a blended question. The question is for Dr. Tapper and then also Dr. Mune because um, the question is blended with the presentations that were given. So you, um, Dr. Tapper, you had uh, presented very well the importance of how multiple genes can come together and can lead to a variant or a condition that we can't quite point out with PGTM, for example. Or anything that we do for the patient ha has implications and will alter the response of the patient or alter what we might see in, um, in testing, like PGTA, PGTM. And so, one thing that didn't come up in, in this seminar, which I'm surprised, is CRISPR, <laughs> right? I mean, we, we have this knowledge of the genome, and we have the capability of now, within limits, editing the genome. So with all that we know and the, and, and the multiple variations of how genes can come together, so how do you, so the question for Dr. Tucker is, how do you, uh, where do you see, um, as far as us in the next five years, as far as listing out, you know, con exact mutations or exact genes that might lead to a certain polygenic disorder? And then with that blended question um, for Dr. Mune to follow is, you presented on whole genome amplification and you presented on like de novo mutations. So you said that there were like 70,000 um, different mutations that could possibly surface from one testing and then that will have to go through um, you know, analysis to then weed out the ones that are not significant. But then with all this emerging information, how do we know what is significant and what is not? I mean, there's, there's so much out there. Is it not significant by itself, but then in combination it's significant? How would we, um, are we, where are we in science right now to make that determination? Do, do we know enough and does that alter our approach? Um, to how we're presenting our data or our understanding? So I think in the next five years, from my perspective, we would be focusing on known phenotypes. That means that if there is a single gene disorder, there's going to be treatments coming through. A lot of them are already coming through. So like cystic fibrosis, there is a medicine now. And then, you know, there's going to be treatments for Duchenne, muscular dystrophy. So single gene disorders, we will be able to uh, surmount in the next five years. There's going to be some movement forward. For polygenic disorders, it, uh, the focus is going to be, because they are mostly adult onset conditions, the focus is going to be on modification and modulation 
to bypass the disorder. So as the knowledge of these polygenic conditions grows, uh, less people will be affected by them. So like diabetes used to be that condition before, polygenic disorder, right? It, diabetes is polygenic, and now we know so much about it that if, if somebody is very well in tune, they are not going to be affected by diabetes. Like, if they are seeing their PCP, they are going to be borderline diabetic for a long time, and then they can do lifestyle modification and not even have to take medicines. So that will be the case for uh, polygenic conditions in um, reproductive medicine if the clinical team stays alert. But I don't think that we would have like a single gene available to be uh, edited or something like that. But single genes will be edited, not in the five years, I'm not sure, because I don't follow the CRISPR technology. Maybe Dr. Munay can like tell us. But for adults with that condition, if it's a single gene Mendelian condition, there will be treatments that will be available. So they would not be as bad affected, I think the polygenic conditions would be, modulation would be the way to go. Well, um, PCT is a selection technique, right? Uh, so we're selecting the, the best embryo uh, in that cycle, um, but we are only making a few embryos. Uh, therefore, um, even though you're right, uh, probably on those 70,000 uh, variations, uh, there are polygenic gene effects there. Um, but uh, right now, the, the, the goal is, is to just without uh, really the severe uh, genetic diseases. Um, you would have that information for the rest of your life for that embryo. So that, that could be um, already a good, a good thing because um, well, you could do it uh, once the, the embryo is born, but um, you will have that for the rest of your life. So let's say you discover that there is um, uh, a polygenic uh, risk in, in that embryo, you can use it later uh, to modify um, the, the behavior and, and the environment. But basically right now uh, what we are aiming to do is you just uh, eliminate uh, really severe uh, diseases. Otherwise, yeah, you will have a list of, uh, everybody here has uh, a polygenic genus score for something, right? Um, although maybe we don't know yet. Um, so obviously, um, if, if you select um, for those 70,000 variations, uh, you won't have anything to transfer. So you have to focus on, on what's really, really important at the time. Hi, I have a question for Dr. Thakur. Um, it's about, I have two questions. One is about resveratrol. How long do you make your patients take it, and have you seen an improvement in the oocyte quality? So it's uh, um, difficult to tease it out because in our practice, our patients are on all the things. So we haven't done a randomized control trial kind of situation of like resveratrol versus not. But I think three months is a good, good um, uh, time, if you have the time, would be. Because what is happening is that it's, uh, because it's a polygenic condition, there's like a lot of different pathways that have to be modulated to get an optimal condition. Um, and my second question is, do you routinely perform toxicity testing on your patients? Like uh, based on the history. I just asked because I worked with a clinician once and from the medical history, he realized that the patient consumes a lot of sushi and he ended up doing a toxicity testing and there was a high level of mercury. And when that was treated, she ended up getting pregnant. So, so yeah. he does that routinely. So I was just curious. Yeah, I don't do toxicity testing in any of my patients. I'm not sure if there are other clinicians in the field who do it uh, in the room. Like we don't usually. Uh, you, you, there's. Uh, do you want to share your experience? Like what? What do you test for? And um, we have tested for again if if the history indicates that they do eat a lot of fish. I have, uh, we're from I'm in Florida, South Florida. Um, we've had a, a significant amount of patients with mercury toxicity, um, females as well as males, 
we've seen some really interesting um, morphological changes in the sperm um, in gentlemen with um, high mercury levels, which have regressed after six months, nine months from not eating sushi. Apparently there is a gene defect that is um, in people that can't metabolize mercury. And when you talk to functional medicine physicians, and we have a functional medicine physician in our area who um, tests for this gene, and so some people can eat as much sushi as they want, and they don't get mercury toxic, but there's others that can't. So it does have to go back to the polygenic you know, predisposition towards it. Um, mercury is the biggest thing we found. We found a couple patients who have been arsenic toxic. Um, apparently, high arsenic levels can be in people who eat lots of rice. Um, we found it in a patient who was taking branch chain amino acids in her workout drinks and we couldn't figure out why she was arsenic toxic or had high levels of arsenic. We're thinking, like, you're trying to get pregnant, why should her, you know, her husband's probably not trying to kill her. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's what you have to think about, you know? Um, but as soon as she kept eliminating things from her diet, and as soon as she eliminated this branch chain amino acid powder that she was putting in her workout drinks each day, the arsenic levels dropped to um, normal. Um, some of our physicians screened for lead. Um, I don't think we found anything. I mean, most of the, I mean, even in areas where you have you know, lead paint and things like that, or you're doing lots of remodeling, it's a thought. But um, mercury has been the biggest thing that we've found. Thank you for sharing that. So I know we talk a lot about reproduction, and that's really where our focus has been this weekend. But um, of course, we know genetics doesn't exist in a vacuum. So I'm wondering, um, Dr. Carvalho, can you comment on that um, DMD case? Of course, you know female carriers have the risk for dilated cardiomyopathy. So, you know, what's the cascade look like from that? You know, of course, there's likely a evaluation with cardiology, right? And then the family testing that's involved. Can you comment a little bit about that case? Ca cardiology? Yeah, the woman. Oh, the woman. Okay, for the woman, yes. yes. The the these cases, I don't understand. My, my, my I, I apologize. So so female carriers of Duchenne ah, have an Duchenne. increased okay. risk, yeah, Perfect. for the dilated okay. cardiomyopathy. Okay. So I was wondering if in this instance no, there was he, additional. No, he doesn't have nothing. Nothing. She is so perfect health, she's perfect health, and in the history of the, uh, her family, he has another, um, another sister, but her mother don't have another pregnancy, only the two sisters, and because of this, uh, we don't have nothing about uh, the male's uh, information, she's so health, your sister health, without any characteristics, uh, nothing about the cardiology, not the nothing, nothing, not and the in particular she's so beautiful woman, so beautiful woman. You look like the beautiful woman. Seems like a model. <laughs> you can't see nothing and predict nothing about the gene, the alteration. So this is a question to Maddie and uh, Christina. Is it like skewed X activation then? Or yeah. like the X that has the Duchenne is not, is actually D is not activated in most of the cells then? Yeah. If she doesn't manifest. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So yeah, yeah, certainly preference towards the non-mutated X in that case. And then on the other side of things with preference towards the mutation, we can see that females might even manifest some of the muscular yeah, symptoms as but well. She does ma yeah. manifest. She does manifest. I know. I had another patient that manifest. Yeah. <laughs> she know. I'd, I'd like to have a, a question for the genetic counselors here. Uh, you, you make a lot of emphasis on family history. But why not to do a uh, whole exome or whole genome sequencing to everybody yeah. and then you don't yeah. have to do that? Yeah, <laughs> the, whole, the whole genome sequence is the best, but it's impossible now for the too expensive now in Brazil, especially expensive. <laughs> yeah, and the other thing is that in genetics, one of our guiding principles in genetics is you have to have the phenotype first and then you go start looking into the haystack. Because our, each one of our cell is like a big 
resource of information. If you go looking, you're going to find, and then you wouldn't know what to do. Like each one of us here has a major change in us, but we are happy and we want to like just be healthy and we want to work out and we don't want to know is the condition. So to Dr. But, but you, you want to know for, for your coming baby, right? So I why not there, do it? I That's think there is a push towards uh, whole genome sequencing for newborns, kind of like the state screening program that exists now. Um, some groups are uh, exploring that as a possibility. Um, so yeah, very interesting. But it, it gets very complicated because the, the thing is with genetics is like adult onset conditions are not, um, like they're not going to cause death in a newborn. Like all adults with an adult onset condition can still live a full life. So it gets really, really quickly, very important ethical situations start to come through. Like we, even with that mutation, that individual could be okay, is the ethical point of view, so. Yeah, yeah but, but you could do it, let's say, you do it for the parents, but you don't tell them, you just do, if, you just do a compatibility test, right? So you, you do a whole genome or whole exome sequencing for both parents and see if there is anything anything uh, that would make that baby um, affected. I think it's going to affect the physicians. Like, I can't hold so much information for all the patients who get through me, and like I know that they have a risk of, sometimes we have non-disclosure cases for Huntington disorder. That's like one case a year is enough for me. Like, I hold on to that information, and I know, and I'm sitting in front of them, and my whole team is stressed out that we don't disclose the information. So I think it, it gets... Uh, it gets really complicated really fast for adult onset conditions if they are not lethal. Yeah. Okay. I, um, can I just yes. uh, just make a comment and then ask a question? So there are, like, especially in the area of cancer, you know, there are, uh, cancer is usually late onset, mm -hmm. mostly for adults. And how, how is your... What are your comments or thoughts on if all newborns, regardless of whether they have gone, you know, they were conceived through IVF, just all newborn babies as a part of standard testing and screening um, are, are, uh, have whole genome analysis performed so that way we can find out that, that much more information from the very beginning and see what they might be predisposed for and during their lifetime at least have a chance at having the healthcare that they need early on. Because as we know, we're, humans are living longer, healthier lives due to medical intervention. So we'd just love to hear your thoughts on that as a provider and then also then as you know, a scientist and a researcher. Can I go first? I have very strong thoughts about it. So the important thing is that if you were to screen a newborn for uh, adult onset condition, and I'm not saying that it may not come, if as a community, as a society, we decide that's going to be the way we will all have to do it if, uh, as a newborn screen. But if you have a newborn, and if, if any of you have children, it's a lot of information already. On top of that, if I knew that my child also is at risk of an adult onset condition which manifests when she's going to be 20, 30 year old, the burden that the parents are carrying and the amount of freedom that you're taking away from that child, because you're gonna be worried about the child, they need to grow. So in my genetics training, we were taught that unless that cancer affects a child, so if there is a history of retinoblastoma in an older siblings, go for it, test, right? If there is like colon cancer with APC mutation, do the testing because it's going to save the child's life. But if it is going to be a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, it only affects adults. It's going to be, we don't want a young girl being seen differently by their parents or by herself, it's, it's difficult. Uh, and then die at the uh, age of 20? Um. No, 18. <laughs> so as soon as she's able to make the decision, because any genetic testing, in the current paradigm of my teaching, and I think teaching for... I think, I, yeah, I think, I, I think that uh, we need to look the, 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 the case, this, the cases. I, I can't uh, view for everybody this i don't like the newborn test <laughs> i don't like because this uh the tilly is, says uh, it's a lot of information to 
to do in a newborn. You don't know, I don't know what this newborn uh, uh, to expose in your life. What is exposed? If it's predict a risk, but I don't know. When you have a genetic a cancer, familial cancer with a monogenic uh, inheritance, it's another case. It's another case. Only a predict, uh, predictive test, it's different for me. I want to, uh, I, I prefer uh, following with a certain, uh, with my, with sure, or mostly proximal of sure. Well, there are certainly differences, right? Differences how you see this. So there are people that are uh, going to want to know information, and we've seen this. We've seen people that are, you know, dem different demographics and different backgrounds. They want to know what to expect. But you have other patients that don't want to know. And we have cases of PGTM cases that the mom thinks she's carrier of something because she's testing for it. She does not want to actually know the answer of the probe optimization. So I think it's going to vary from case to case. I do see value in screening the genome because next step in medicine is knowing. Knowledge is power, right? If you know enough, you can, you can meditate and you can prepare for, for the future. I think we are um, um, reaching uh, the, the, uh, um, the end of the, uh, this session. I uh, really would like to uh, thank each one of you for bringing your perspective in, in genomics and uh, to Dr. Kor for, for your wonderful presentation. Um, uh, I would like to uh, you know, uh, ask you guys to applaud our panel and then we'll do a closing. <laughs> So just a few uh, minutes so we can wrap up this um, conference. So I will start by thanking each one of you for being here full time since the beginning of the conference till now, it's already 12, 15. Thank you so much for, for your dedication, for your attention and for your you know, contribution. Um, this uh, conference would not have been possible without your presence here. And this is what Genes is about. Genes is about connecting the minds and allowing a stimulating environment where you can come and learn. As you see, the talks are completely unfiltered. They, it's science, it's science-based um, you know, talks. And we have tried to cover most of the topics, uh, bringing embryology, endocrinology, genetics, uh, genetic counseling, and we have covered technology, automation, and AI, artificial intelligence. So we've tried to cover the entire spectrum uh, that would uh, eventually be the source for innovation in the horizons to come. Um, I would like to thank um, every speaker that came to us um, to present, the, whether it's data or knowledge, we are very fortunate to have such an awesome panel of speakers. This doesn't happen every day. So we, we feel like we were very, very lucky to have this panel of speakers. Some of them have traveled from Europe, like uh, uh, Dr. Jose and Dr. Santi have traveled across the continents to come here and present. So thank you so much. Um, second point I want to make is I would like to thank all our vendors who have trusted our very first conference and uh, I, I hope that, that they have established some connections. Um, I would like to, to thank uh, the workshop, uh, Tony Anderson and others who have contributed, Dr. Sheila, who have contributed in the teaching uh, uh, portion of the workshops, the embryology workshops. And uh, finally, this conference would not have been possible without Progenesis team. They did such an awesome work organizing the details and. And, and you can feel they, they, they have compassion and love for what they, what they do. I would like to thank the organiz uh, organization uh, team, including Dr. Sheila Ali, and then uh, I would like to thank Alex Mejia, and then thank uh, Dr. Fernanda, and the rest of the team, Maddie, and, and um, you know, the, the entire team. And so with that, 
uh, talking about the team, and then I'll hand uh, a couple of, of notification before I give the mic to a uh, closing statement uh, with uh, Dr. Sheila Lee. So the contents of this webinar, uh, webinar, this conference, is going to be published on our website. You may find it also on YouTube channel. So you will have access. We will notify you with an email letting you know where the content is going to be available so you can go and browse the talks. I know that some of you couldn't hear all the talks. So you have a second chance to do that. And we will email you a certificate so that you can claim your CU credits. And with this, I'll hand the mic to Sheila. Thank you, everyone. Everyone has just been so supportive during this entire process for us that we're, we're just overwhelmed by the support and the love that we feel from our audience, our speakers, and everyone involved um, in the conference. Um, it, it, I find personally it um, just brings me so much happiness that there are so many of our audience members that share the same passion as I do. That is, we, we understand that we have this much knowledge and then there is so much more that we still would like to um, learn. And this conference in particular was aimed at looking at one thing, which is improving our practice, whether that be embryology, clinical, or genetics, but looking at how to do that from multiple angles. And I think our speakers did a fabulous job at as showing us those variable angles. And I hope that with the combination of all of those talks and seeing it from, from all of the sides that I have um, hopefully given you that comprehensive view. And when you, when you go home, I hope that you retain that and look at every problem that you encounter, whether that be with your patient or within your teams or within your um, centers, and you look at it from multiple angles now, and you broaden your perspectives. And with that, we are wanting to announce a save the date for next year. So we are gonna bring jeans back in full force um, June 6th through 8th of 2024. So please, please um, plan to attend, and we would love to have you back. And uh, we will share more information as it comes out. Last but not least, we'd like to, from the entire Progenesis team, wish you a warm farewell and wish you safe travels home. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.